Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the... Uh, one moment. They are okay. not, they are not uh, coming in. We have to wait that they are... They were in the front door, shall I say, and they have to come in. Oh, okay. Slowly, but they are coming in. Yeah, we have already uh, some of them here. Uh, Maria João, I've just uh, given uh, co host status to both Larissa and to Jonas. Hello, Jonas and Larissa, you're having co host rights. You can connect your cameras if you will. Uh, so, uh, Antonio, you ma you have to make them co-hosts. You made them uh, panelists. Okay. And perhaps, um, yeah, yes. Ines is here. Okay. And Larissa too. Uh, and both yes. of them are already co-hosts. Yes. Okay. Yes. And Dora, if she's there. Okay. And I'm going to see everyone has mic. Okay. So I think perhaps you can start, yes, sort of swail. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to session uh, three of the poster series. Um, the title is uh, BRIPA Ceremony. I was curious about what it meant BRIPA, but then I read it and uh, it's Best Research in Progress Award. It's a new award um, aiming at uh, recognizing quality of research in progress. Um, and uh, it's called poster, but in reality, it means uh, paper uh, representing research in progress. And you can uh, download the, the papers. Uh, I've read uh, uh, some of them and uh, it's worth reading. They, you have also uh, the presentations in PowerPoint or in video, and I suggest that you take a look. And if you haven't done that during the, the two other sessions, um, there were about uh, 16, I guess. It's the number that I have in my head, but uh, uh, the president of the jury for this award may correct what I'm saying. Uh, in fact, uh, this is um, uh, an interesting award because it tries to recognize uh, high quality uh, research and uh, that is being uh, done by the uh, authors. And um, this is um, uh, an award, like I said, it's new, it's fresh, it's fresh from this year. And it has been um, supported by read. Uh, in Portuguese, uh, it means in English, uh, uh, the Journal of Distance Education and E-Learning uh, from Universidade Aberta. And they, this journal and the editor-in-chief, which is the president of the jury, my colleague and friend Aldo Freire, uh, with whom we have uh, several work together and debates uh, uh, it's been a long time that we have worked together from Universidad Aberta and from the laboratory lead from, from the same uh, university. And um, th this, um, this uh, process of uh, selecting uh, the winner of this uh, award uh, as uh, 
two phases. Uh, the first one was to uh, pre-select uh, three final uh, candidates and um, uh, this jury that made the, that made the, this selection is um, chaired by, like I said already, by Professor Aldo Freire uh, and the other members are Antonella Poche from the University de la Studi di Tre de Roma Tre de Italy. Uh, she has been the ex-coordinator of the NAP steering committee and Vlad uh, Nia Hesco, I hope I pronounced it correctly, from the Polytechnic University of Timisoara in Romania. He's currently the coordinator of uh, the NAP steering committee. And uh, another member is um, Antonio Quintas Medas, professor at the University of uh, Berta uh, in Portugal and uh, from the same laboratory, LEAD, and uh, Professor Isolino Oliveira, also from the same university and from the same laboratory. So, after this introduction, um, I, uh, of course, um, uh, would like to know the winner. I, I, I don't know the winner. I know who I voted for. Uh, but I, I, I don't know the winner. So I, I think that it's time to hear the president of the jury and editor-in-chief of the Read magazine from the Universidad de Berta, uh, my colleague Alda Prater. So she's online and the floor is yours, Alda. So you, you can um, uh, proceed. Thank you, Alfred. Good afternoon to all. It's a pleasure to be here in honor, uh, to honor the authors of the posters uh, voted by the participants. This jury had to select three posters, which should be analyzed and voted on by the conferences participants. 16 posters were analyzed, analyzed ugly different is some of them with great quality. The task was not easy. Since the choice should be made considering work in progress, several interesting works were eliminated because they did not fit the criteria. On the other hand, it was necessary to specify what could be research in progress. Therefore, it was adopted as criteria to consider only research that had already started even a short time ago. This criteria in turn led to elim the elimination of two high quality works that reported investigations already carried out and another which was a research project. Then a new analysis was made on nine proposals remaining, which led to some discussion among the members of the jury. The analysis of the consistency between the question under investigation and the chosen methodological approach, including the analysis of partial and preliminary results was therefore other criteria considered. Lastly, the analysis of innovative aspects related with the main idea or with methodological approach all allowed to the selection of the three works to be submitted to the voting on the participants. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to say some words about the posters. The author of the paper, Integrated Learning by Design Pedagogy in Teacher Training, Jonas, shows us an ongoing research aiming to use educational data mining to empower students to improve learning. It's a promising work in progress and could be available 
contribution on how the technology can support an innovative approach to assessment for learning. For now, the investigation is still beginning, but we hope it will bring important and new results. The poster, teacher training through argumentation to promote autonomous learning in educational environment mediated by technology, the, the Larissa, introduces an investigation focusing on an especially important problem in distance education, student autonomy. Bearing in mind that we'll see since now a rising interest on models of hybrid learning, the issue of autonomy will be on the agenda. The reported approach presupposes the need to train teachers to be aware of the need to foster autonomy in students and bring, brings to light an innovation way of doing it through argumentation in teaching training. While the results are still partial, the approach is interesting and we hope, we hope that the research will raise good recommendations. Distance learning versus emergency remote learning Portuguese schools in a turning point for digital transformation this is a beginning work on a very important issue raised by the current pandemic situation. The results will be crucial for all teachers and schools, bearing in mind the implementation of sustainable hybrid education ecology. The methodological approach selected is very promising. It's all for the moment, Alfred. Thank you. Um, uh, it, it's been an interesting presentation and complete about uh, who were the finalists and their authors and the topics. So now I would like uh, to show you the certificates that are going to be awarded. Uh, I mean, the candidates uh, are probably nervous, but you have to wait a little bit. And um, so the secretariat can, can, can show this. Okay, there you go. So you have um, the, the honorary mention certificate to, to, to Jonas Becklin and his paper. Can we see the next one, please? And this is the, the, the second one that, uh, second, but not in order of merit. So it's the second in terms of the least. It was granted to Larissa Enriquez and Mirna Hernandez from UNAM. And the next one, please. And you have here the winner of the um, award to um, Ana Paula Afonso, Antonieta Rocha, Maria João Spilker, and Lina Morgado. Um, and uh, I would like uh, Aldo Pereira to say a few words right now if uh, uh, he thinks that it's wise. Otherwise, I will ask the, uh, the winners to say some words or somebody from the, the, the authors. So Aldo, do you want to say something now or? Oh, yes, yes. Thank you, Alfred. I uh, would invite all the authors of the, the, three, the three posters to submit them to the Journal of uh, Distance Education and E-Learning to, to be pub published in the uh, next edition, please. Thank you, Alfred. Thank you. Now I repeat my, my invitation to the authors or a representative of the authors that have won the award to say some words. 
I think Jonas was was here. Perhaps you can. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. yeah. Quite quite well. So first of all, thank you for the uh, whole conference. I've been uh, oh. so inspired because in my uh, research within my master thesis, I'm struggling with the methodology. And by having all these uh, work in progress and seeing how uh, researchers have used the data to actually prove the outcome has been so valuable to me. And uh, the, the poster itself uh, as the motivation was, uh, I agree 100% myself because when I seen uh, the Common Ground Scholar, CG Scholar platform, we basically are mimicking the project they've been started already. And when I saw that it actually is possible with educational data mining to start giving the students feedback on their work before it's handed in to evaluation. Uh, that is something that I think is so important. Uh, and uh, I look forward to uh, putting this into a more uh, format for the correct publication. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas. Larissa, do you want to say something? Please do. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, I also want to uh, thank uh, the committee and Eden for doing this workshop, this research workshop, and also for the acknowledge that they gave us. Um, it really, it's a challenge and it helped us to, to keep on moving. Uh, we have been, Mirna and I, very interested in working with teachers and students as well and autonomous learning. But we believe that teachers are fundamental in enhancing autonomous learning with students. So all the questions, all the comments that we received and this event is very challenging to continue with our work. So I just want to thank you all for it and congratulate all, everyone. Good, thank you. So thank we you have the winner. Good. Yeah, I want to say it. thank you. May I? <clears throat> yeah. Hello all. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, Larissa and Jonas and all the other participants. Uh, being a researcher is um, not an easy task. And so just for that, we are all um, uh, in, a, in a, well, congratulated. Um, second, uh, I would like to, um, in my name and on behalf of my fellow co-authors, uh, I would like to thank Eden um, and the members of the jury for this uh, recognition of our work. Uh, it is a great honor to receive this um, award, which we uh, accept as uh, a motivation for further work, but uh, above all, as a great responsibility that our peers have placed upon us as a research team. So thank you very much for this award. Thank you. Um, thank you. And congratulations to all participants, authors, especially for the finalists and uh, the winner. I think that um, Eden has that uh, uh, capacity to enable sharing uh, research. And uh, some of you have heard it before, but um, I think personally, I think there's not enough research on what we are doing here in Eden. So. Any research is welcome, especially if it can be shared with the others. So thank you to all that have presented the papers. I would like to thank uh, uh, the, the, the magazine from the University of Berta, the journal, uh, and uh, for this award. I think it's an incentive to everyone to, to publish and to uh, next year to apply for the award. And um, I wish all a good uh, rest of the conference. Thank you very much for being here. And um, uh, let's go for the, the last session in, a, in a, some a time and uh, enjoy the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you at all.
Thank you, Alfredo, and congratulations to all the, the winners and the finalists. I see here Larissa, Jonas, Anna, Maria, João, and all the others. Um, Tim is already here. A team will be leading. Uh, actually, he'll the, he's the chair of the closing keynote session. So thank you very much, Alfredo and Alda. And I will now um, uh, 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 give the floor <laughs> to Tim. Tim, are you there? Thank you. Yes. Yes, I am, Antonio. Thank you. For some reason, yes. the, uh, the video camera won't start, but that, that doesn't really matter. You all know what I, what I look for. Terry is here, Martin as well. Uh, as, you, as you know, uh, Maha will be joining us a little bit later. You have the floor now. Thank you very much, Antonio. Okay, Shairu, please, please, it's, sorry to interrupt you. Please give uh, Timothy uh, a co-share, co-host uh, status so that he can. Done. <laughs> Okay, so Timothy, I think that you can now share yes, your screen. Yes, I can. Oh, that's okay. Much better. Great. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maria. Okay, so welcome to this um, final closing plenary uh, session. We have uh, three speakers uh, this afternoon who I am very um, honored to present here. We're going to start with uh, Terry Anderson, who, uh, who really needs no introduction, but I'm, I'm going to introduce him anyway. Um, Terry is the Professor Emeritus of Distance Education at Athabasca University in, in Canada. He's an educational researcher and teacher focusing on ICT tools in teaching and learning. He teaches in master's and doctoral education programs in distance education at that university. Terry is the editor um, Emeritus of the Open Access Journal, the International Review, of research on open and distance um, education, a RODL, and a member of TECRI, Technology Enhanced Knowledge Research Institute at Athabasca University. He's a regular keynote speaker at education and training conferences, both online and face-to-face, -face, and his specialities include research, teaching, and social networking. He also serves on advisory committees with the Aretha and the Canadian governments, and serves on several editorial boards. And he's going to talk to us today about quality through three generations and aggregations of online learning. Thank you, Terry. Great. Um, I, I, my video isn't allowed. I can't seem to start my video. Oh, there it is. So good. Well, um, I thank you, Timothy, for that rather long introduction. Um, and what I would like to do now is to uh, get my slide share, uh, my slides going and... Here we are. Thank you. I assume that you can see that, Timothy? Oh, you're mute. Yes, yes, I can. It's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, it is a real pleasure uh, to, to, be, to be asked again to, uh, uh, to uh, address an Eden Research Workshop. I have very fond memories of uh, of uh, Eden Research Network, con network conferences. Uh, I, I mentioned in a little teaser that uh, that, that was the my very first international uh, keynote was uh, at uh, Eden uh, in Oldenburg in 2004. And I told a joke about uh, why distance education was better than sex. And I won't repeat that joke, but you can search it on Google. And uh, the, the uh, I, I guess, from that experience, uh, I don't know, I, did, uh, I think the jokes have uh, ended up, so I've been invited back, and here I am today, too. So thank you very much, Eden, and, uh, and, and everyone who's been organizing this conference. Okay, now why am I not going forward here? Okay, oh dear. Um, I always start uh, uh, keynote presentations by talking about the values that inspire me, and I assume that this inspire a lot of you, uh, a lot of distance educators, online uh, teachers in general. But I really think we can and we must improve the quality, the effectiveness, the cost, the access, <clears throat> all of those social justice issues that have driven us from, from, the, first, uh, from the first distance education models uh, up to where we are today. And secondly, I think we really need to get into lifelong education and decide that, that whatever they do in a formal education should be a, a stepping stone uh, for student empowerment and freedom uh, so that they can go on learning uh, throughout their whole lives. And finally, the, uh, the cost of education, I think it's a human right. And I think we have to do you know, more to, uh, pr to providing access when we can or 
as we must. Um, just to show a little uh, joke here of the, uh, this is uh, what people uh, have in their profile picture versus how they actually look in a, in a Zoom meeting like we're doing right now. And uh, to give you an, uh, an illustration, that's the picture that was on the keynote. And uh, you can see uh, I'm a little bit older, a little hairier um, than that. And uh, so, so so, um, you know, that's one of the advantages of online learning or on, on virtual conferences and ways that our identity is, um, is, is mixed uh, with, with the technology that we use. Um, and one thing Antonio uh, said on the opening session of this conference, he said that uh, he just reflected that it was his first virtual conference. And I guess that struck me as strange. Um, uh, well, you know, I guess it gives us, you know, we talked about all the many sessions, Tony Bates and others talked about the COVID-19 impact uh, on teaching and learning. And it, we, we really, it gives us, the, the epidemic gives, gives us a time to reflect uh, as professionals, as a change agents. But what is it for you personally? Uh, you know, how is this conference been better, been worse, been the same, more accessible, less accessible, cheaper, uh, all those sorts of things. And what is the most significant personal learning that you've had from this conference, professional learning? And what do you think is going to change at your institution as a result of this uh, conference? And uh, I, or, or are you feeling like uh, this tweet from Amy Morgan yesterday? She said, I want to go to a real conference with bad coffee and pastries and get some pens and a tote bag instead of logging into another webinar. Well, I think that uh, for those of us who have attended some of the sessions that uh, this isn't just been another webinar. We've had some, some very interesting talk, but I, I, I like the debate uh, very much, the Oxford debate uh, <clears throat> that Alan Tate uh, facilitated. And uh, the question, let me just paraphrase the question, the COVID-19 pandemic will have no lasting impact on Eden's and my own professional development. And I think that's something we can think about as we uh, go about our own uh, professional learning and, and reflect on, on, on how this has been for each of us. And let me, let me do a little brag sheet. This is my one and my only uh, claim to internet fame is that uh, I organized the very first online conference ever held online. Uh, and that was in 1992 for ICDE. And um, it, it, it was before the internet, so we used BitNet and NetNorth and FidoNet and all sorts of other ways that we hacked together electronic communications asynchronously through email. But since then, uh, Lynn Anderson and, and I wrote a book about online conferences, and uh, that, that's a little dated too, uh, 1990. Uh, uh, I think this book was 2002 or something like that. But anyways, they've been a long time and it's, uh, it's interesting that, uh, that us as the professionals, leaders in the distance ed field, how we're not that experienced uh, in online conferences yet. So one of the things that I've gotten by, I, I, I tend to ask uh, all the students that I come across post-secondary and secondary, uh, to uh, tell me what it's like to learn online as they've all been thrown into it uh, in Canada as in most of the world. And you get, what surprises me is how different the reactions is. You know, some people, uh, you know, it sucks. Uh, other people say it, uh, it used to be way better. Other people says, I love it. I can stay home, I can do this, I can turn, turn off, I can repeat, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, but it strikes me that there's a huge variation on what technology are they using? What time is it asynchronous, synchronous, unpaced, paced? Uh, what quality is goes into the, the professional development and the instructional design and the, the teacher skill? What, what net literacy do the students have? Um, what age are they? Because uh, I think it, it varies over age. But maybe most important, and what I'm going to talk about today is that there's three, at least three uh, different pedagogies that are used in online learning. And they, they have different outcomes, different intents, and they go in different directions. And so when we talk about what's quality in distance ed or online ed, I think we really have to be clear about 
what are the criteria? What's the pedagogy that we're using? And I know that educators love to say, it isn't the technology, it's the pedagogy. Well, that is true, but they do have a dance together and, and the one does influence the other. Okay, um, this, this is a quote from a teacher in Australia. And notice that she says, what pedagogical principles drive what I normally do? In other words, what do I do in the classroom and how can I use these technologies to transform them? I think that's the common, I heard, I heard that from Tony Bates talk is, uh, and from the debate that, you know, people tend to teach the way they were taught and what they're striving to do is to take that online or that classroom experience and put it out online. And if that's your criteria for what's a high quality course, then it'll be quite a bit different than if you're having a self-paced learning or, or as you'll see, uh, the other uh, the three generations the way I've sliced it. Um, but it's about interaction, empowerment and engagement and learning is experience, everything else just information. And we see information glut, but we don't see learning, uh, you know, growing anywhere near as fast as the content. So how do we put those two together is what I'll be talking about. And again, I think showing my age here, 2011, John Ron wrote this article, Three Generations of Distance Education Pedagogy. And I wanted to revisit those three with the kind of an update in both the technology and the way we think about teaching and learning uh, in the last nine years. So the first generation, um, basically cognitive behaviorism, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it's instructional design. If you went, if you were trained as an instructional system designer, especially in North America, uh, you would have learned about Gagne and how learning works. You gain their attention. You tell them what's going to be taught. You stimulate recall. It's very structured. It's there's clear ways that teaching and learning uh, should happen, and uh, and then you assess performance and you enhance uh, transfer opportunities. So structure structured a way forward that we followed for many years, uh, especially in the early days of distance education. Uh, but again, the cognitive revolution came along and we started learning about chunking and cognitive load and working memory and split attention. All these other uh, it, things are variables that interact uh, in the teaching and learning context. Um, but one of the things that it celebrated uh, was the capacity to learn alone. And, and I think that's especially when we talk about um, uh, about you know the challenges teachers have going from the classroom to an online enver environment. There's this idea, and students have it as well, that I really need somebody to, to hold my hand, to tell me what to do, uh, to work in a group and learning alone. But this first generation doesn't necessarily. In fact, it almost celebrates the idea of freedom of space and time and pace. And that's why at Athabasca in our undergraduate program, it continues to this day. There's no paced instruction. It's all, uh, you pace yourself. You start when you want, you finish when you want. Uh, it allows uh, individualization, freedom from groupthink, uh, and the power of learning to learn. And again, people talk about the value of working in groups, but it also gives you the freedom from groups. And I think that's an important part of, of lots of different ways that we learn things. So what is the nature of knowledge? Uh, it's coherent, existing, uh, almost independent of perspective, context-free, and it can be transmitted. You can take knowledge and I can transmit it to other people. And it assumes a closed system with discoverable relationships between what goes in, what comes out. And that's why, uh, you know, from a research perspective, uh, it's, it's, it's very powerful and sometimes very easy to, uh, to, to measure the, whatever the, uh, the inputs that you have and measure the output on a final high stakes exam or something like that. Uh, the technologies, uh, again, Martin's going to, I assume, talk about OERs, simulations, textbooks, one-way lectures, but there have been some very significant uh, advances uh, with the technologies uh, for the first generation. And up on the left, you see a, a, just a straight MOOC, a, a video uh, lesson MOOC. I'm sure you've all seen them, but most of you probably participated in one. But what's the, the difference is on the right, students are typing in comments or questions, or, and, and they're not doing it in real time. 
because the MOOC is, is self-paced and, and they're able to just type it in. And so you can see somebody's comment, even though that comment was by that person studying alone, you know, two weeks, two years ago. It's kind of, it, it provides a, a, an economy and a scalability that we don't see in the other generations. And down at the uh, bottom here, you see one of my classes of voice thread interaction where people are not only adding their text comments asynchronously, but they're adding video and audio as well. I think there's a number of tools that are available uh, to do just this. Um, we're also seeing that uh, it used to, you know, there's been a big push on chatbots uh, for, for customer interaction. And uh, they, some of them can be very useful as probably many of you have interacted with a chat box, but we're just starting to see them used now um, in education uh, for you know, any number of, if you think of how many questions a teacher gets that uh, are not about the subject matter, but you know, what day is the exam due or um, you know, I'm gonna be late, oh, you know, all the sort of the logistical kind of stuff that isn't really relying on the teachers, um, her subject matter, nor her uh, magnetic personality. They just want information and machines are great at that. Um, and then this is from the States. Uh, one of the registrars says there's a humanistic connection to a chatbot with that I would never have expected. Students are also almost more comfortable sharing those fears with the chatbot. So there's a, uh, you get into the, the fact that the interaction in the first generation is with content and that the tools of the content are changing very rapidly. And of course, MOOCs, you know, it's easy to say all oh, MOOCs are so, you know, 2012 or whatever that uh, they're, they're, uh, they're not making any money or they're going away or whatever. But as you can see, the number is continues to grow and the number of people engaged in them. OERs, um, and as we've heard, many of talk uh, people recently, you know, it's not the, the, the educational, it's not the open educational object, it's the open educational practices that, that we really need to work on now. And mostly I'm a huge fan of OERs because they save time. There's so many educational interventions that just take up teachers time. And I think OERs have a good potential to reduce that uh, time. Um, we're starting to see very powerful tools, scary as well. This one's, I don't know a lot about, but LightSail, it's for um, K-12 learners. But, you know, the, the loneliness of the distance education teacher is that the teacher, especially in this first generation, uh, hardly in the past anyways, in correspondence days, uh, it wasn't really in touch with the student. They couldn't really know what's happening with these students. And now we have these tools where the, the machine is reading out things and listening to students. Uh, it's uh, saying what pieces, they're, what speeds they're reading at all the time. Just a whole bunch of, uh, of data that, uh, that can be had. Uh, again, this is a commercial company uh, and it was rated by this common sense selection as having a huge uh, high learning rating and a pedagogy rating. And I just underline the point, it depends what kind of pedagogy we're talking about. Is this a good tool or is it a bad tool? And then of course, learning analytics. Um, I know the Solar Group is on to their eighth or ninth annual conference in their journal. And um, there's uh, learning analytics is, uh, is huge and it especially works uh, with this first generation. Uh, but uh, colleagues, uh, uh, well, um, you know, are, are these uh, dashboards really doing the job or do they just present what's easily measured? And uh, uh, <clears throat> Matcha Yuzit and Gasovic and Pardo I wrote just a few months ago that uh, are found by analyzing these dashboards that they're rarely grounded in learning theory. They cannot be suggested to support metacognition and they do not have and for any information about effective learning tactics and strategies and have significant limitations in how their evaluation is conducted. Uh, as researchers, we tend to love graphs and pictures that show the truth. Um, but it's, uh, you know, let, let's remember that, uh, that, that learning happens inside people's heads and it's not easily measured nor displayed uh, through learning analytics or any other way. 
And finally, uh, the big challenge with this first generation, especially and maybe all the generations, is this idea that uh, data is going out there, it's being used, especially if you start using social media, commercial social media. Um, and I hope that most of you have seen Zuboff's book on surveillance capitalism. It was a real eye opener for me. But there is a real danger of cloud computing, owning and selling our data. And I, I congratulate the EU for doing a lot more work on, you know, trying to get on a handle on what Google and Amazon and Facebook are, are up to in terms of controlling public uh, discourse. Uh, so there's huge privacy issues. And my own solution that I struggled with at Athabasca and was not that successful, but John Drone and I built a social media, our own kind of semi-private, um, Facebook, if you like. And I think that's part of the solution. I think students are going to and teachers are going to demand that our institutions are and not having our information sold uh, to the highest bidder and used for whatever kind of uh, purposes. Um, the, but the real power of this first generation is it maximizes delegation. The student and I don't have to be responsible for deciding the curriculum, seeing if I know it, measuring my progress. I can delegate that all to the institution or to the teacher. And, and freeing people, students from that delegation is just one of the freedoms, and I'll get to them a little bit later, but it is an important one for this generation. So how do we research it? Uh, usually, uh, first generation focuses on empirical stuff. Um, and we ask the questions, when you add these new technologies, does it really add value? And we have to remember to subtract the known and the unknown side effects. If you can, un, un, if you can subtract something that's not un, that is unknown. Um, and then asking the question, how does enhanced use of technology affect those with less technological and ex economic flexibility? And we saw that uh, in, in one of the other keynotes uh, talking about, uh, you know, the difference in, uh, in, in literacy uh, levels among students uh, based on gender and socioeconomic background. And then uh, the, this first generation has a real problem with high stakes testing and figuring out how we can should make sure that assessment is really assessing learning in a, in a way that's both efficient and effective, but or most importantly, that it's effective. It really does help students and not just prevent uh, stress or give them stress and barriers. So first generation conclusion, interaction is mostly one-to-one. -one. It's an important role of student content interaction uh, rather than student teacher or student student, we're talking about student content interaction. Uh, it has assessment and privacy issues, but it's scalable. And remember I talked about the right to basic education is one of the values that drives me and reducing costs. And the first generation, why we invented it in the first place for correspondence was it is scalable. And when you talk to developing countries, I was at UNISA a few months ago and, uh, you know, where they have hundreds of thousands of students, uh, you're not going to scale up uh, the second generation as, as we'll see in a second. And OERs, MOOCs, analytics, they promise to reduce cost and increase efficiency of, of, of these interactions. Uh, again, they present challenge, but they, they present promise too. Okay, moving to the second, I hope I'm not taking too much time here. Um, it's group orientated. Our, and rather than the focus on the individual, we start to focus on the group or the team or the class or whatever. So it's exclusive in that you're either in the course or you're out of the course. And it's usually closed group instruction on an LMS or, or some other way. Uh, oftentimes it's a, you know, it's a very teacher dominated uh, kind of, a, of an environment. And, you know, like down the bottom, the picture of Moodle, I remember um, the people who invented uh, Moodle always bragging that it was a constructivist based uh, uh, tool. Well, I think we've seen that it can be used for constructivist purposes, or it can be used for first generation or even connectivist uh, ways of learning as well. So it's, I don't think they're inherently one or the other. Uh, but there is a focus on collaboration and shared purpose. Um, and again, this, this quote down at the bottom, creating a successful online community is dependent on knowing what works in the face-to-face -face environment and implementing. Notice the transfer there. Uh, 
They're saying, you know, if I can get this right in a face-to-face -face like I've been doing all my career and for hundreds of years at our university, I can just move it into an online environment and it'll have a successful online community. And there's some truth to that. It is a very nice transition from face-to-face uh, from -face learning to follow this pedagogy. It's socially constructed, uh, arrived at through dialogical encounters with other people. And so it, it really focuses on learning together, sharing, defending your views, uh, all the stuff that I'm sure many of you have taken uh, courses uh, with, uh, with uh, or, or been taught to teach in a constructivist uh, manner. Uh, again, synchronous really made a big difference to this, this second generation. Uh, I remember my, my uh, PhD supervisor, Randy Garrison, some of you may remember him, but he, he in fact, he was on one of the panels in this session, uh, but uh, he, he made his career in a way by arguing that we had to get away from this industrial model of Otto Peters and we had to really talk about real interaction. And uh, what he meant by that, it was synchronous interaction. And whether it was all of these bio audio conference in those early days, but now, of course, as we're doing right now, uh, it gives you immediacy, it gives you pacing. So every Tuesday night, I know I have to do this or do that. And I think that can be very valuable for people. Uh, social modeling, we can see how others answer, we can see how the teacher operates. And that's been an important part of teaching and learning for for, for, well, for a long time. And as I mentioned earlier, it's a comfortable media for uh, students and teachers. And you think, well, if video conferencing is good, then immersion must be better. And you've seen Second Life come and go, mostly go, but it still uh, is, is kind of a fringe technology out there for teaching and learning. It, it's, it's interesting to just speculate why if a little bit of, in, uh, of intra or of uh, of visual and is good. Why isn't uh, more than just a talking head? Why don't we have places in our learning? And uh, I don't know what your own experiences are. I've always, when I used to take classes in there, I'd lose half of them and it was just a little too disconcerting for old guy like me, who knows? Okay, um, just a, an example of the kind of availability of an OER here, just I wanted to give a, a uh, talk out to uh, this, this uh, open uh, access book on collaborative learning, lots of activities, lots of projects, lots of ways that, uh, you know, if, 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 if teachers who are being forced by COVID into an online uh, environment, uh, they often don't know how to conduct collaborative kind of learning. So what do they know how to learn? They know how to lecture. So they lecture. And, uh, but I think there are resources and I think as change agents, uh, it's, it's useful for us to, uh, to promote them. Uh, the social form is group based, as I said, uh, it's limited in size. Uh, I have seen uh, courses going up to 50 students per, uh, per, per uh, teacher, if you like, in a real time session. I don't think you can go too much higher. Uh, Dunbar's maximum number, you know, 150 people who, who you can get to know. Anyways, uh, there's the, one of the things that uh, John and I have always thought is that what defines a group is that you have mutual awareness or at least the capacity to become mutually aware of each other, of everyone else who's in the group. Uh, is there too much teacher domination and dependency? I guess they'll leave that to you, but uh, it isn't scalable, uh, at least not like the first generation was. Um, some great new tools. Uh, I was particularly like this by Diana Loreland and her uh, team in London. Um, is that it, it, it breaks down this constructivism into actually what the teachers do. And if you look at your proposed course, and as you're planning it uh, or your anticipation of it, how, how much is content interaction? How much collaboration? How much discussion? How much investigation? How much practice? How much production? And then this uh, you go is directly working in a spreadsheet and it draws some uh, nice little spider graphs there for you to see that really uh, this is what my course from a constructivist perspective should look like. It should have com major components of all of these. And really, what does my course have? And I think is a really useful uh, tool. 
Um, group management enhancements, uh, you know, the Google Docs, the Slack systems, uh, all of these things I think are great for groups. One of the problems that I always felt with groups is you can do almost anything at a distance in a, in a synchronous group or even asynchronously, um, but uh, it's going to take twice as long or it takes a lot longer. Just getting people coordinated and on uh, at first base at the same time, all that sort of thing. Um, uh, but the tools really help in the, uh, along those lines. So how do we research it? I think we focus on the lived experience of participants, at least it's the normal way it does. That term lived experience always gets me because what other kind of experience is there but lived experience? But anyways, uh, it, it, the, the researcher often adds why or how, not just counting and how much. Um, it, it, it's uh, often used interviews and focus groups. I love the tools now that you can use that will do voice transcription and, uh, and uh, qualitative analysis that we never had before. Uh, but it does raise the question, it's a focus on interaction and how much interaction is enough, how much is too much? And what, uh, what inhibits or supports this critical uh, group collaboration in the second generation? So you can see that if, if your idea of what you're trying to do in your online learning is really has a constructivist focus, it will have a lot of different outputs in terms of quality. It'll, it'll look different than the one on the first generation. So a summary, not scalable, it can be expensive. There are many new tools coming out to enhance the efficiency. It focuses on the human skills, student to student and student teacher. And as I said, it's the easiest pedagogy for teachers and learners transitioning to online. So the third and final, and I know there are many ways that one can cut up educational tech or educational psychology or pedagogies. And I've just, John and I have picked these three, but, but there are other alternatives for as well. Um, and so I'm, we called it connective pedagogies as opposed to just connectivism as George Siemens and Stephen Downs would say, uh, but it also uh, has uh, lots of uh, uh, pedagogical uh, uh, basis. It, it looks at chaos theory and emergence and uh, Dave Cormier's rhizomatric learning and communities of practice. And uh, often uh, what I've noticed about researchers in Europe is they're a lot more interested and knowledgeable about actor network theory than uh, than we are here in North America, and so I think that 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 is a strength that 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 can be applied to this uh, third generation. So uh, from George Siemens, you know, his big eight that he uh, uh, published, I think it was two thousand and four. Um, what is connectivism? It's created by linking to appropriate people and to objects. And maybe, I think he even says it's that wisdom can be created and stored in non-human devices. And so whether that's exactly true or not, I don't even know if George would argue these days, but it's certainly true that we can offload to machines in ways that we had never dreamed about before our cognitive processes. And we should, uh, we have the opportunity to exploit those. Uh, it's about capacity to learn rather than what I actually learn or what I can answer on a test. It's my showing my capacity to learn with and from machines, other people, remote resources. But it does assume the ubiquitous internet. And we all know that there are uh, not, no, I wouldn't say maybe there are lots of people on this planet who do not have access to ubiquitous internet at affordable price. And the other fact is that it's emergent. Uh, one never knows exactly what's going to happen to uh, when, when, when starts, uh, uh, when you do a connectivist space course, so how many people are going to enroll, how many people are going to last, is it going to be just a, a few or, and you have to wait and let the kind of the magic of human and networking uh, uh, emerge and that's challenging. I wrote a blog a long time ago, just talking about the three th ways that you can connectify your course. Um, and networks effects is probably the biggest one, that things can get amplified, you can find things through accessibility, through the search engines, and persistence is that the learning that happens this year 
uh, doesn't you don't start over next September doing the same old courses that you taught last year because you've learned some things since last year and so if your students learn some things and so by building on the artifacts that those students create in the past we we help them to create content in a connectivist uh, model not learning in a bubble um, that was one of the things we tried to do with our homegrown Facebook at Athabasca was to say, sometimes I want everyone in the world, including my grandmother, to be able to read what a wonderful thing I've just done or picture or something like that. Uh, but other times uh, I want to close. I want to just have my teacher know. I just want to have my friends know, my class know. And so having that control over it, it's not in a bubble, but that bubble can 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 expand uh, to, to the whole world. Um, but it's very disruptive, high levels of net literacy and presence. It's scary for a lot of people, teachers and students, uh, requires new roles for teachers and students. And there are big issues about uh, artifact, artifact ownership, persistence, privacy, uh, for many years of my grad courses, I would uh, have would post what students had written or research assignments or whatever from past years with their permission. And it was very interesting. Some people thought, oh, man, I would never read that. I'd be cheating. And other people said, oh, thank God I could read that because I can now understand what I'm supposed to do. So there's this uh, this uh, uh, legacy that, that can live on and is celebrated in a connectivist environment. But it can be a bit too manic uh, for some. Uh, this is, again, this is from uh, John Dronemey book Teaching Crowds, where we did these kind of spider graphs where uh, we, we talked about all the kind of freedom that, that students have or could have or should have and teachers as well. And, uh, and then uh, for each of these uh, uh, aggregations or, or pedagogies, we drew these kind of maps. And this is just the, the connectivist one. And if, if, the, if it goes out to the edge, then it's maximizing the freedom. So you can see the location, you can study where you want, what time you want, pacing is often set by this individual students. You can socialize with whom you want or network with whom you want. Um, the approach in the pedagogy, a little less say, but it's, it, it's still pretty flexible. Uh, but where it really fails is notice this one, we had to invent the word delegability, couldn't think of anything better. But sometimes, I want to choose to let a teacher teach me this. It'll be a lot better for me and faster. And connectivism doesn't really lend itself to that. You know, it's kind of the burden is on the on the learner to to go out and to uh, you know help to create the network, create the the linkages and the connections, and, and teach themselves a little bit more uh, in this in this uh, model. So, how do we research this? Uh, this is a research seminar. Uh, well, um, there's ideas of uh, checking or measuring innovation, wayfinding, how do they make sense of the, the net, how do they operate, what kind of skills do they have in terms of creation of content, uh, all those sorts of things. Um, again, examining and archiving of the learning artifacts is very important. Uh, do, to kind of measure the types and the diversity of students' net presence. And uh, as for all of these things, I'm a huge fan of design-based studies because I think rather than just running around measuring things, we have to do interventions. We have to add a new tool to the game or you know, sort of try to uh, try something, measure it, don't get hung up on it being qualitative or quantitative, just be pragmatic and figure out what can help uh, my students and, and my teaching. So just to summarize, connectivism born on the net, the locus of control shifts to students more so, it's emergent and disruptive and does raise the question, uh, do you have to you know, already be fairly advanced learner in order to maximize uh, learning uh, using this pedagogy? So um, we were, John and I did some other work just, just talking about the, the aggregations of these. Again, repeating the individual is the focus in the first generation groups in the second and networks and sets. And you might not be familiar with the idea of a set, but basically it's 
all the people who are interested in subject X or who've enrolled in this MOOC or something like that. And how do we make connections and allow them to help each other learn within the set, even though you'll never know their names or, uh, you know, they, 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 they go beyond the personal identity. And I think my time is ending, so this is my concluding uh, slide, is that uh, students really, and teachers, deserve the experience of trying out all three of these generations. Um, learning, learning structured content by oneself in groups and in networks. And there is no one pedagogical model, context, depth, intensity, or aggregation that supports learning for everyone. Uh, but I think we need multiple types of, or multiple kinds of pedagogy driving forward, but we also need multiple types of research. And I hope that uh, this little talk has inspired you in your own research at, at, at within your institution and as an individual. So uh, I did upload the slides. Um, if you just do a search for Terry A on SlideShare, you can see it there. And um, I look forward to any comments. Thank you very much, Terry. That was a very interesting and entertaining uh, uh, presentation. Um, we've got time for a couple of questions. There's one from uh, Maria in the chat. Um, you talk in your in the second edition of your book, online conferences. What would uh, you like to change or add? <laughs> well, that's good. Um, well, I guess if, if you look at the sophistication of the tool, the platform that we're using for this Eden conference, uh, it's way above in terms of both handling the logistics of registration, in terms of the profile pictures, in terms of, you know, switching between synchronous and asynchronous, integrating various technologies. So there is a big technological push. Uh, the second thing I would talk more about is just that we had this idea, you know, that you have to jump on an airplane and go a long ways away in order to get away from the real world and, and you know, immerse yourself in the conference. And uh, we weren't very good at multitasking. Whereas now, when you go to the conference face to face, half the people are sitting with their laptops open back home, you know. So there's a big convergence in face to face and other uh, conferences. Uh, and third, I we did emphasize it a bit and did a, a bit of a study on the impact on carbon emissions of, of virtual conferences and air travel, you know, especially for me in North America to, to come to Portugal, despite the quality of the wine, uh, it would, you know, it's starting to be a more important thing weighing on my head is just, uh, you know, what is the cost of all in terms of not only money, but in terms of the environment. And I think that's a lot bigger now than it was uh, in 2004. But uh, I hope somebody, it's surprisingly how few books there are on virtual conferences. There's, there's sites now, commercial sites, uh, uh, but uh, I think there's lots of uh, research that could and should be done by some young people. <laughs> yeah, I quite agree. Thank you very much, Lask. It was a, a great answer. Final question then from my, my colleague, um, Alfredo Suera. Um, how do you suggest um, that we should focus on the assessment of student learning? The assessment of student learning. Yeah, um, well, I think that there's growing evidence that the, our reliance on the high test, high stakes testing, uh, it, it's pedagogically not very sound. We know that people uh, get themselves under huge amounts of stress, whether it's sitting in their home being watched by a machine or a human, uh, uh, or whether it's... Uh, um, I think we need authentic assessment, ways in which we more directly tie what the students do to uh, what's, what's being assessed rather than just sitting them in a room and having them write an exam. And we have a big legacy within the, the distance education world anyways in the open universities about uh, you know, celebrating and really thinking that, that that final exam is of very critical importance. And uh, I, I know it's going to be hard for us to give that up, but uh, there isn't much pedagogical grounds for it. And there's certainly some logistic problems that uh, COVID is bringing up. And of course, we've trained students to, to be cheaters in many ways, because it is such a high stakes that they have very little choice in. And they react as you, you might expect. I wish I had the answer to that one. <laughs> I think you've given us some good insights. So thank you very much again, uh, um, Terry. I'm going to pass over to my, my second uh, presenter here, Martin Weller, who is the director of the OER Hub at the Open University in the UK. 
He's a professor of educational technology and his interest has always been in the application of new technology to academic practice. It is the um, Open University OER Hub research team running a portfolio of projects examining the impact of open educational practices. Martin joined the OU back in 1995 as a lecturer in AI and he chaired the OU's first major e-learning conference, T171, inspiring name, back in 1999 with nearly 15,000 students. Uh, this involved a number of uh, strategic shifts in the OU to make it an online provider. He was the first director of the VLE, recommending the adoption of uh, Moodle, and is currently the academic director um, for the learning design project and also director of the OER Hub. His research area is in open education and digital scholarship. Um, he runs a blog about this and has authored two books, The Digital Scholar and The Battle for Open, both of which are open, available under open licenses. He practices what he preaches. Um, he's a regular and reasonably well-known blogger at edtechie.net. And today his title is 25 Years of EdTech, Why an Understanding of the History of Educational Technology is Important in the Pandemic. Thank you, Martin. Thanks. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Cool. So I'll try sharing my screen. Five books, if you don't mind. Uh, <laughs> well, you go. <laughs> Let's get it right while we're here. <laughs> cool. Um, is that good for you? you can That's that. fine. Thank you very much. Cool. Uh, so, yes, okay, cool. So uh, what I'm going to talk about is my fifth book. <laughs> so actually, uh, 25 Years of Ed Tech. Um, so this has quite a lot of resonance with what uh, Terry was just saying, actually. Um, I probably should have gone before Terry, I think, because then he could have done the deep dive into some of the things that I'm only touching upon lightly. But, um, so uh, an alternative title for this would be, uh, I remember when this was all paper, because really 25 years is quite a nice time to look back over ed tech and think about, because it takes, well, it depends when you started from, but if you go back to sort of like the mid nineties, um, that's really when the internet started to become pervasive. Uh, and I work in the Institute of Educational Technology at the Open University, which was founded um, in 1970. So obviously we did lots of things. We were called EdTech before the internet came along. But I think really in the mid nineties is when it started to become synonymous with uh, digital technologies and, and the internet. So that's the sort of uh, era that I'm, that I'm looking at. Um, and another alternative title is why knowing some history of ed tech is a good idea in the pandemic and hopefully I'll, I'll have time to come to that at the end now you'll notice there's a slightly different version of each of these graphics on, on each slide uh, and you can remix your own I'll give you a link to remix the, the cover of the book later which is done by uh, my friend Brian Mathers uh, so just about the book uh, is Creative Commons licensed published by uh, Athabasca University Press Thanks, Terry, for, uh, <laughs> for helping set them up. Um, uh, so the digital version is freely available uh, and the visuals have been done by Brown Mathers and they're also freely available and you can download those. Um, so uh, I think we've covered all this from Tim. So I work at uh, uh, I IET at the Open University. That's me on uh, Twitter, that's my blog. Uh, so the two other books I've written that are open access are the Digital Scholar and Battle for Open. Uh, and I'm also the um, director of the Open Program at the Open University, which is our um, uh, interdisciplinary uh, program where students can choose an, any module and combine them, which is becoming increasingly interesting think, in times of pandemic. Good. Okay, so uh, an outline for the talk. I'm going to talk about the motivation for writing the book in the first place and the approach I took. Um, as we're in a research seminar, you can really criticise my, <laughs> my research methodology in writing this book. Um, and then I'm going to look at some of the, the technologies in the book and sort of split it up into three phases. I noticed that Terry had three generations, there must be something about us. Us old blokes, we like to split things up into three phases. Uh, then I'll draw out some themes, I think, that come out of that analysis. And, and then hopefully we can uh, think about what it means in times of the pandemic at the end. So the approach I took was uh, in 2018, uh, it was the Association of Learning Technologies 25th year, and I was the president of Alt at the time. And so I stupidly said in a, in a conversation, why don't I write a blog post for each year um, for those 25 years? Uh, so I started doing that. And my approach was just to choose a technology from every year from 94, which is when we we're looking at then, um, and just sort of use it to explore uh, some of the issues that each of those technologies raised, uh, how they were used, and what it meant for EdTech going forward. 
Uh, but it's really based on my experience. There was no kind of like you no know, survey of what, what we should cover. Uh, and I slightly fudged it by saying, I'm going to choose when they become significant, in my view, not when they're invented and those kind of things. And of course, when they become significant is affected by my personal experience and my geographical locations. They may be more significant in other places at different times. But anyway, I, I wrote this blog series, um, which you can still see there. And at the end of it, uh, it, it seemed to resonate with people, despite the fact that I felt I was running out of steam by about 2012, but I kept going. Um, and so a lot of people said, you should turn that into books. So that seemed like a good idea. You know, uh, I had the kind of basis there to, to start a book. Uh, but there are some, so I went away, I locked myself in a, in a cottage in Cornwall in, in the middle of a big storm in the winter and wrote a book. Um, and it was a good thing to do because it kind of gave me room to kind of explore some of those issues in more, in more depth. But just before we go any further, there are some kind of limitations to that approach. So you're, you're probably going to hate me then this talk because I haven't mentioned your favourite technology. There are some glaring emissions. You'll say, what about mobile learning? What about game-based learning? And they should all be in there, I admit that. Um, or I have mentioned your favourite technology and you think I've misrepresented it. Um, I put things in the wrong year. Sometimes several things were refined for the same year, so I had to kind of like shift some around, I think. So you might say, this should have gone on this year or this was when it was significant for me. Or I've missed something that's kind of not that you think is really significant. I also think this limitation of putting out a technology every year isn't that good for kind of perhaps longer, more abstract themes, things like uh, accessibility or digital identity or academic labor. I think there's a there's a flavor in all of those across all of those technologies you might pull out, but it's probably not as good for, for kind of drawing them out over a longer time. Uh, they almost need a 25 years of their own, I think, to kind of explore those. And it ends up being quite technology focused, perhaps the technology is the kind of easier hook, I think, to kind of latch on to each year. Uh, as I mentioned, there were some, some glaring emissions, of which I just say sorry. Um, but I think in the end, it's not just a nostalgia trip. And I'll come on to why, I mean, it is kind of quite fun to, um, to kind of look back and think, oh, I remember bulletin board systems, whatever. Um, but I think there's more to it than that. So I think the way to view it is like those 100 best film lists, you know, there's much characterized by what's, what's absent as, as what's in them. So uh, it's more of a, a discussion starting point. Let's, let's kind of put it that way. But I think what's, what is more interesting is the, the motivations I thought for uh, and there are a few things first of all uh, based on work in educative technology you know it's, um, it's a field that people move into from, from other areas not like so the example I always give is if you went to a, a chemistry conference I'm probably wildly stereotyping chemists here but if you went to a chemistry conference and you sat down at lunch probably everyone at that table would have a, a chemistry PhD because if you go to an ed tech conference, then people you sit there at lunch have might have come from computer science, psychology, philosophy, art history. It's kind of a very rich mix. I think that's one of its strengths. What it means is we don't have a kind of shared understanding and, and common kind of knowledge base that, that arises from that, that kind of common canon of, of knowledge. So I want to try and provide one, one form of that, not the form. Uh, I'm not claiming that. Um, I also wanted to push back against this kind of this kind of feeling we often see in the popular press and particularly coming out from um, kind of Silicon Valley, this idea that um, higher education is too slow to do anything, to do any innovation, and it really needs people from outside to come along and save it. And, uh, you know, it's never going to survive the digital world, and those kind of things. So I wanted to demonstrate a kind of history of innovation that has taken place in higher education. And I, th I think by having the, the book and looking back over 25 years it allowed me to draw out some, some of these kind of longer themes and lessons that will come to hopefully if I stop waffling. Um, I wanted to highlight the necessity of a critical approach and I'll come on to that in the, in the third of my phases. Uh, but I think mostly it was this desire to provide this kind of alternative historical narrative. Uh, one of the, the sort of concepts that often gets pushed in education technology technology as a whole is this idea of disruption and the whole idea of disruption is that you know something's come along and sweeping away everything that's gone before um, and it's a really bad theory just in general it's particularly bad in, in education we keep having this kind of year zero mentality like so people saying oh you know moot to the first time uh, we've done online learning and as tim said you know many of us have been doing online learning at scale for some time before that so it's quite a surprise to learn that it was invented in 2012. When you see that kind of repeatedly, 
So I wanted to kind of provide this, this narrative that, that refuted that, that approach. Uh, this cartoon from Brian, I think, sort of sums it up uh, more easily than I just said. So historical amnesia, I think it's kind of a phrase. So we just like, 94, hey, we've invented online learning, then MOOCs 2012, we've just invented online learning. And then probably during the pandemic now, we've, we've reinvented online learning. And it's just like each time it seems to be starting from scratch. And so these were the technologies I chose. So you can uh, look out for your favorite ones there. But don't worry, I'm not gonna have time to go through all 25 years now. We're not gonna do this in real time 25 years later. But you can see the kind of the type of things that I've chosen there. So uh, I think um, uh, uh, Terry mentioned uh, open educational resources, MOOCs, VLEs, those kind of things. Um, and I've kind of spread it up in, in the book, I don't do this, but I think since then I've started to think of it as kind of three sort of phases, really. It starts off optimistic, you're going, wow, what can we do with this stuff? Then you get this kind of mainstreaming of, of e-learning. Then I think we move into a more kind of critical phase around a, a lot of the technology. So I think to start off with that, um, that optimistic phase, and to pick out just a few, uh, few technologies, Okay, good. Um, I think the one to kind of pick out the most is, surprise, surprise, the web, really. So, um, and again, I'm not saying when it was invented. Around sort of 95, I picked as the year when it was becoming mainstream and, you could, you know, people would know what you're talking about if you said a web browser and those kind of things. And the real potential for it for education became apparent. Although lots of people were still dismissive of it. And I think what... Uh, what the web really showed us is that it removed that barrier to publication. So anyone could publish anything. Um, and at the time that felt really liberating. You suddenly you didn't have to do all this other stuff. It meant other, it meant conventional universities could do distance education and we, at the Open University distance education, we could do a lot more interactive stuff. And I think in many ways, we're still struggling with what the web gave us, that kind of freedom, because it seemed really great. Anyone could publish anything. What that meant was anyone can publish anything, and that <laughs> and that's become a real issue. You know, it's like as we see with um, uh, the sort of far right and a lot of the kind of misinformation and disinformation we see kind of online. And I think that so so really, I think all of the things we're dealing with at the moment come from the fundamental liberty that the web kind of offered us. Um, constructivism. I don't know something on this now because Terry's covered it all. But around ninety seven, so um, as Terry said, constructivism has has long roots, kind of. Um, in terms of concept and that. But around 1997, I thought it was really interesting. I would go to a lot of e-learning conferences and almost every paper started with, we took a constructivist approach to our, to our learning. And sometimes I think um, that was an excuse for, for poor design. Basically, I haven't done anything, but hey, the students can construct their own knowledge, so therefore I'll just call it constructivist. But I think more, more interestingly, perhaps more fairly, um, I think what it really showed was academics thinking when you think about what the technology offered, and I think because it was new, people were thinking, what, did, what can we do now that we couldn't do before? And for instance, we were really excited about hypertext, you know, that idea that you had non-linear text and people could go off and explore these things and construct their own meaning from that. Um, and there were lots of, you know, talk about different pedagogies that we were sort of resurrected that existed before, but applying in an online setting, you know, problem-based learning, resource-based learning, all those things. And I think in many ways, we lost a lot of that excitement. Uh, so I'm, I'm the guy in Terry's cartoons going, online learning needs to be better. So um, I think in some ways we lost some of that experimental approach. And it's interesting when you look at kind of very conventional MOOCs now, they're, you know, they're not constructivist at all. They're very kind of straightforward, linear, watch this video, do this, then do this. You know? So I think a lot of that kind of experimentation has been lost. And I think mainly that, that might be a result of the fact that because the internet and that is so pervasive now, we almost don't see what it offers, we don't, we don't see its newness. I think when it was new and novel, we wanted to kind of uh, explore what it could possibly do for us. And I think wikis are a really good example of that. Um, and I remember going to a conference in 98 and seeing uh, Mark Goodsdale talk about wikis. And I came back and I was like a convert. Like, You've got to put everything in wikis, it's amazing. Um, and obviously there's wiki, uh, Wikipedia, which is kind of a fantastic success in that. But actually we don't really use wikis a lot in, in education. Uh, and I think it's an interesting question to ask yourself you now. Why aren't MOOCs in wikis, for instance? You know, so we still, and, and I came across a, a course outline that a, a Mark, I think, had put together and all these different uses of wikis. And actually it was a really kind of radical proposal for how you construct courses and how students share knowledge. A lot of that kind of stuff that Terry was talking about, students building on previous cohorts and 
working across different years and working together to create a, their kind of own content. Um, and if you would have put it in now, that'd be quite a radical proposal, I think. So again, I think some of that kind of experimentation got, got lost somewhere often. Which brings us into the kind of mainstreaming phase. So towards the end of the 90s, you know, e-learning was a, was a common term and people were sort of moving towards it and most universities recognised there was some something there to explore. So um, my choice for 2002 was uh, the VLE or the LMS. Um, and around this time, uh, lots of universities adopted um, different VLEs, so Moodle or Blackboard, those kind of things. Um, and I think it was a kind of a, a Faustian pact in some ways, I think, adopting VLEs. What they allowed you to do was to move very quickly to a certain space in e-learning. So prior to VLEs, um, so I, uh, as Tim said, I was the VLE director at the OU, and we sort of, every faculty had their own set of technologies, which might be some guy in a basement who's put it together himself versus and some might be some third party software, some might be a collection of bits and bobs, you know. Um, so there's kind of big variety that going on around the university. And what having a, a, a VLE allowed you to do was to kind of move very quickly to get everyone to the same point. So you could roll out student support, staff support, you had kind of universal production methods, so you could put everything in the same platform. So that got us very far quite quickly. But then I think what happened was um, a lot of the institutional processes then began to cement around the VLE. So we began to have a roadmap for development. We began to talk about how are we going to do this in VLEX or how are we going to do this in Blackboard, how are we going to do this in Moodle, rather than thinking about what it was we wanted to actually do. So it's almost like this, this sediment build up, built up around uh, the VLE. It became quite hard then to move beyond it. So we would have education, I want to do this. They said, well, we can't do that in the VLE, so therefore you can't do it. So I think it stopped some of that experimentation I talked about in, in the earlier phases. And around 2006, we had the explosion of what we called Web 2.0. Uh, and this kind of led to the inevitable um, uh, internet boom and bust. And uh, lots of these technologies don't exist anymore. because it turned out you did actually need a business model <laughs> and you couldn't just rely on lots of users. Um, but I think what Web 2.0 did more fundamentally was make us much like the initial uh, web. It made us question some of the fundamental practices around um, that we hold, hold dear in academia. So David Weinberger talks about filtering on the way out rather than filtering on the way in. We've kind of developed all these systems that filter. So uh, academic publishing is a really good example of that. You know, we sort of do peer review and only when it gets past a certain quality is it published and that's go out there. This filter on the way out means you publish most things um, and then they get filtered whether that's through uh, references, whether that's through you know, ratings, those kind of things. So, and I think that was quite interesting for us in academia to think about what's fundamental that we want to keep and what can be adapted and changed. And so there's like the physics repository archive where they will publish any paper, a preprint of a paper that looks like an academic paper. So it would be good enough to be sent out to view is a filter, but they don't actually review it and then publish it. And that's become one of the biggest uh, sort of sites around. So it has a much kind of quicker turnover of, of publication and, and knowledge sharing. Uh, and I picked Twitter for 2009. Um, and I think Twitter probably leads more into the next session. So at the time it was kind of really interesting and what can we do with this platform? And, and I think th the good things about it were that it really helped like blogs, it helped kind of break down some of the, the barriers around education and, and, and the boundaries of the institution, if you like. So suddenly you could see academics behaving like human beings online, but that might not always be a good thing. But uh, so I think that you kind of help blur some of those boundaries and that I think that in general is a good thing. But as we know, it also has led to lots of other issues, you know, trolls and uh, Nazis and all sorts of things. And I think it raised a really big issue for us as academics about how much we encourage students or our uh, colleagues to partake in this world. Because if it becomes that you need to have a Twitter profile in order to get the benefits and there's all these kind of good things from it, then also you're pushing people into an area that kind of carries potential harm with it. Which brings me on to the critical pessimistic phase, I think, of EdTech, which, which I think is important. We've kind of moved from this, isn't it all great, to let's be more critical about it. So I think this really began around MOOCs around 2012, you know, when suddenly um, MOOCs were everywhere and everyone said, oh, we're 
suddenly developing online learning as if it's never happened before. Um, and many of us were just sort of like banging our heads against the wall, the idea that this stuff, you know, um, was, was that new. And, and again, uh, MOOCs are still struggling for a, a business model, uh, but, uh, but equally, they're, they're great also. There's like millions of people have learned online through these things, and we don't want to say that's a bad thing. But I think, um, you know, the idea, as um, Sebastian Thrun said, you know, that there's only going to be 10 providers of global education in the future. It just isn't borne out. And actually, MOOCs um, really need universities to, to kind of operate carefully. And we soon found out that actually, the people who succeeded in MOOCs were people who already had a good education. Uh, so they were, this idea that they were going to democratise education just wasn't borne out. Um, learning analytics. So again, uh, you know, Terry talked about this. Uh, analytics are interesting, I think, particularly for us in distance education. So we use them quite a lot in the Open University. Uh, so not necessarily a, a bad thing. And I think the sort of analogy I give is like if you're given a lecture, um, actually a face-to-face -face lecture, so I can't see any of you at the moment, that if you're given a face-to-face -face lecture, you can see if people are being bored or staring out the window, and maybe you'll change your approach and that kind of stuff. And that's been really difficult to do in distance education. Uh, and so having some of that feedback and some of that data uh, allows us to, to change our courses, adapt if people are struggling in certain areas. That's thing. But also it comes with a whole wealth of issues around who's, who owns that data, who's doing what, um, and how do learners feel about it. And, and I think some of that kind of analytics we're seeing around exam proctoring as well is particularly pernicious. Uh, and so the last book in the last year in the book is uh, 2018. So I uh, just like with the EdTech's dystopian turn, I think it was kind of really when we could stop saying, you know, you could be the idea that you could be neutral about technology, EdTech, I think had really gone by then. And people could see a lot of the kind of damage and potential issues. So it really meant that we kind of had to try to live a very kind of careful, balanced, nuanced line, I think, around our application of um, technology. So to quickly pull out some themes, I'm not sure what time I'm supposed to finish now, so we're running a bit late on. Um, I think uh, over the 25 years I looked, you could argue that the technology part of ed technology was, was bigger, more significant. But I wonder if we're seeing a shift now, particularly with that kind of idea of criticality that people are actually much more thinking about, okay, what's the educational potential of these things? Um, I think, as I said previously in the last slide, I think innocence and neutrality is no longer a valid stance. You can't say, oh, well, it's just technology. Technology is neutral. How people use it is up to them kind of thing. I think we need to think about how these things will be used. A lot of the time, a lot of the time they're very kind of pernicious and uh, maladjusted use. It's entirely predictable. I mean, so, well, okay, if that's what's going to happen, how do we stop it? Um, there, I think it's interesting to see these kind of recurring ideas and cycles of interest. So, Artificial intelligence comes up a lot through the history. And for instance, um, I did my uh, PhD in artificial intelligence back in the, in the 80s, um, the 90s, the early 90s. And um, even then, people were saying, oh, it's going to get rid of teachers. You won't need teachers. And we're going to have these intelligent tutoring systems. And about 10 years later, the same people would say that. So, well, actually, it was more complex than we thought about, and we didn't speak to educators. Well, you know. Big surprise, but now we're seeing that exactly the same idea again. We can get rid of teachers, you know, it's like this AI will teach everybody. Which I think brings on to this idea of that I think what comes back through a lot of these kind of uh, looking back at history is what's the role of humans and how does technology relate to it in terms of the educational process? Um, and I think it's more interesting. So I think some technologies seek to replace people and so, say, you know, people are the expensive, inefficient part in the system. And other technologies, I think, seek to help educators. And I think it's the, the latter that are of more interest and actually more, more viable for us. And lastly, I think just I want that point I wanted to make to demonstrate this history of innovation. You can see that it does happen. And actually, there's been these kind of big, broad, wide ranging uh, innovations that have taken place in, in, that have come out of higher education and are either developing technology we're taking technology from elsewhere and adapting it for different use and that kind of stuff. So the idea that technology needs some kind of savior on a white horse to, to ride in and, and, and rescue it from, from the evil internet and not understanding the stuff just isn't true. Uh, so um, I, if I've got time, I'll talk about uh, in time of the pandemic. So I was joking on Twitter that you know, particularly at the start of the year, it felt like being in education technology suddenly felt like you were in the kind of the action movie version of, of that life, you know, when you're suddenly getting called upon to do all these things. And who knew that, you know, education technology would one day be a kind of emergency service 
So I was joking that I wanted to be like one of those those cops in a film who, who gets to hang off a, a helicopter and says, I'm getting too old for this shit. So uh, Brian drew <laughs> Brian drew me this, this little graphic. Um, but suddenly, you know, EdTech became very relevant. It was the only way we could carry on operating for lots of people. But I think what that means is you're getting lot for lots of the principals and vice chancellors, they didn't want to be running an online university. They're not prepared to run an online university. They want it to go away. So what they're looking for is someone who'll come along and sell them a magic solution. So, you know, here's, here's the big button that says go online and it'll all work for them. And, and people are going to be willing to sell that to them because they can get lots of money for it. So partly, I think it's really important now more than ever to understand what's gone before, understand what's worked and what hasn't worked and why for those things. Then you can ask sensible questions of these things. So I'll just give a couple of examples. So one of the things I, I saw was um, people saying, aha, look, exams are, are really problematic and they're quite right. Uh, they're actually a weak point in the whole higher education system. So you know, bringing all these people together at the same time, at the same place for a real high stakes assessment, assessment is just really kind of not a very good thing to do. But there are other alternatives. Lots of people saying, oh, you can use blockchain for assessment so they can compile all these small tasks and put them on their blockchain. Well, okay, that sounds good, you know, but if you've got a knowledge of at least some history of the headset, you might ask, well, what does that offer me that an e-portfolio doesn't already offer me? And e-portfolios have been around for a long time and they haven't necessarily revolutionised um, assessment. So how will your blockchain for assessment overcome some of the problems that e-portfolios face? Because actually the problem with e-portfolios, if there is a problem, I think they're, they're pretty good, is not necessarily to do with the technology, it's to do with getting employers to recognise them or to get um, educators to adapt their uh, teaching to break it up into small tasks. So it's got nothing to do with the technology. So, so blockchain isn't going to solve those problems. For you. So I think you know, just knowing that, that would be good to ask those questions to people if they're selling you a, a blockchain solution. Uh, the other thing I saw people talking about suddenly was now we're all shifting online. Um, why don't we share content? You know, so at, at the end of the late nineties, one of the years I give over to is the idea of learning objects. And you know, learning objects, the idea was why are we all creating this content? You know, um, individually when we could just create a few really good ones and share it between us. You know? And learning objects went around for ages, and, they never, and though they were a good idea, they never really took off. They were kind of over-engineered, and sharing content wasn't really something that um, academics were used to doing. So if you want to think about reusable content, it'd be well advised to look back at learning objects and think, what were the problems with them? Uh, is there something different we can do to overcome them this time? Uh, and we've already got open educational resources, how best can we use those and adapt those? And uh, perhaps lastly, the, the VLE and the LMS, you know, lots of people are jumping to new technologies, but most universities and institutions already have a VLE. Um, you need to think about how you can move beyond it maybe, but actually the tech isn't your problem here. The, the problem is more likely to be um, training staff and, and giving staff confidence and skills in, in using the VLE in interesting and innovative ways that aren't just replicating the lecture uh, and perhaps some of those uh, pedagogies that, that Terry talked about. So uh, in conclusion, I'm on time, I'm not sure. There's a long history of ed tech innovation in education uh, it doesn't need saving. So anyone says to you, you know, there's a revolution coming and we're going to change higher education, you know, ask them in which way um, it needs to be changed or saved. Um, and I think understanding some of this history is essential to making good decisions right now in the pandemic when we're facing lots of issues. So um, here's some fun stuff. So you can download the book there, uh, free. Uh, I created a site where you can find, there's a timeline, you can get all the free images, there's even a Spotify playlist for 25 years of EdTech there. Uh, you can go to the Remixer site uh, and remix the cover yourself. You can change the color and the text and that kind of stuff. Um, the good people at uh, Hypothesis have created a, an annotated version, so you can go in and tell me all the things that I've done wrong. And most excitingly, uh, perhaps uh, Clint Alonde is uh, uh, over the summer got in touch with me and said, can we do a, an audio book version of um, 25 years and I said that'd be great you know but I didn't want to read it um, 
so I read a couple of chapters, but he put together a big community, so uh, people reading one chapter each. I think Maha's in the audience, I think Maha reads a chapter. I, I apologise, Maha, for making enough to read one of my chapters. Um, but that's, that's, that's going to start being released, I think, on November uh, 4th or 2nd. Uh, I said there'd be like an audio version, audio book version. And I think that's really exciting because that really demonstrates the power of it being an open resource that we can do this. And then uh, Laura Paschini has been doing um, a podcast about each of the chapters so we can then talk about, uh, not me, but other people talk about all the things that I've missed out and why, why it's rubbish, but that will be released about each of the chapters. So there's kind of a whole kind of ecosystem around the book, which is good. If we want to discuss stuff, we have time. I thought we could talk about uh, some of the reasoning behind the book and you know, my motivations. Uh, you can tell me all the technologies I should have covered, uh, some of those general themes, um, or the, or the relevance of the pandemic and, uh, and particularly I think you know what your context is like and, and how your whether it might have relevance to what you're doing or how if you could push it under someone's nose it might help so I'll leave it there thank you Tim thank you very much uh, Martin as ever um, a very entertaining uh, talk I just love the t-shirt by the way um, I mean not the t-shirt the cartoon sorry I was going to say I'm getting too old I want that as a t-shirt so. there is a t-shirt I, sh I should be wearing it I'm not wearing it but I, you can get a t-shirt of course <laughs> always, always with the okay. merchandise. Okay, we can leave the discussion stuff for the Q and A session afterwards. Just sure. one question, if you, if you'll if you'll permit me. Um, there's this thing about um, educationalists who love to tell us that pedagogy comes before technology, like the horse and the cart thing, and that's probably true up to a certain point. But I mean, if you think about it, also um, change happens as a as a, pro, as a combination of evolution and revolution. So everything goes on quite nicely, and all of a sudden, someone pulls the carpet out and it changes. Yeah. I mean, an example which may or may not be that revolution is five G that's coming on. Well, that's holds some possibly cool things. I mean, how do you see that fitting in? I mean, how do you see it historically, and what importance do you think it'll have in the future? Five uh, G, in particular, you mean? Or... Well, yeah, both things: the evolution, okay. the revolutionary thing, and five G is an example. Yeah, I think. I think these things take a long time to, for us to realise what they're going to do, uh, and it's really the thing we think they're going to do. So, I think um, you know it's like with the iPhone. You know, we we had like um, uh, mobile learning for a long time, but it was quite hard work. Often you'd have these kind of text-based interfaces, and you had to download a special. No one really used it. You know, it's not, but suddenly you've got this device that everyone's using all the time, uh, and that makes kind of augmented reality. Well, it's just I think it's that lowering the threshold of of, of of people's application of these things and, and how easy it is for you. I think that's when it becomes quite exciting, you know, when it's actually easy to do rather than something you've got to really sort of put people's minds to and do stuff. And uh, maybe the pandemic is the big revolution, you know, suddenly all these people have shifted online and stuff. And, and I think uh, you know, Tony Bates has done some good analysis on that, you know, and I think he's quite right to say it's not like everyone's going to carry on and teach everything online, but I think what will come out of it is with a much more kind of blended provision and stuff. So I think. I think it's that almost like the kind of social acceptance of the stuff is, is, is the kind of bigger, bigger revolution, I think. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Martin. There's a couple of questions in the Q&A too, I'll leave you to uh, answer and uh, move on to our final speaker, Maha Bali. Um, she's an Associate Professor of Practice at the Center for Learning and Teaching at the American University in Cairo. She's an editor, editor at Hybrid Pedagogy Journal and um, an editorial board member of Teaching in Higher Education, online learning journal, learning, media and technology in the International Journal of Education and Technology in Higher Education, and also the Journal of Pedagogic Development. She has blogged um, for the Chronicle of Higher Education's um, Prof Hacker, DM Central Blogs, and Al Fanar Media. She's the co-founder of Virtual Connection, uh, connecting.org and co-facilitator of Equity Unbound. Uh, she's a former international director of uh, Digital Pedagogy Lab. Um, she was the ninth person uh, interviewed on the Leaders and Legends of Online Learning podcast, and she was featured alongside 15 amazing women of the Mo Open Movement in the Uncommon Women 2018 Coloring Book. She's a learnaholic, great term, writerholic, and passionate about open and connected educator. She tweets a lot at, at Bali, Mal, Bali Maha and blogs a lot um, at her blog, blog.mahavali.me. And today she's going to talk to us about paradigm shifts we need in open and online learning post COVID. Thank you, Maha. Thank you so much, Tim, and thank you everyone uh, for joining me today. 
I, I, after I named this keynote, I kind of felt like paradigm shifts is a very big word. So we'll talk about that again <laughs> towards the end of this. Uh, first of all, assalamu alaikum. This is the uh, Arabic for peace be upon you, it's a greeting, and I wanted to share this picture of flame trees that I used to see from my windows that cheered me up during COVID, and I like sharing, you know, colorful things and pictures and my slides because we're all, we've all got some bad days. Um, my slides are available for commenting, you can comment on them now or anytime afterwards uh, at bit.ly slash Eden Valley, this is um, uh, case sensitive. And before I get started, I know there are a few people here um, in the panelists and in the attendees. And could you type in the chat how you're feeling today? Tell me how you're feeling right now. And if you've been sitting for an hour or longer, you may need to stretch. I want you to be awake for this keynote because I'm going to ask you to participate. So let's see how many people are, um, are able to, to just share in the chat. How are you feeling today? I'm going to pause for a second while people do that. <laughs> You're welcome for the stretch invitation. All right, I'm glad everyone's feeling well today. But it would be totally okay if you weren't, because some days in this pandemic are, are not as great as others. I hope you and your loved ones are safe and well. <laughs> Good that you've had a walk, Jose. Or Jose, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Good, but slothful. Yeah, that happens sometimes. Okay, so my journey for today, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to just talk you through how COVID-19 made me rethink a lot of what we consider to be good practice in open online learning, how it surfaced some important aspects of it. But I also, instead of just telling you what I've um, come to conclusions, is I also ask people on Twitter, because that sometimes sparks uh, ideas for me uh, that hadn't been clear to me. So I've been in the field of e-learning since 2003. I feel like I have to say this because the other keynotes are people like Terry Anderson, who sort of, and Martin Weller, who sort of invented e-learning and Tony Bates. So I have to say, I've been in this field for quite some time, <laughs> although I guess I was uh, at the early phases of, of being here. So I've been here for 17 years, right? Uh, but I've still had some paradigm shifts with COVID. Um, it's, it's changed my mind about a few things. And so just a quick question again to the audience. Is there something like when you hear you know, COVID has caused a paradigm shift. Did that happen to you? Type in the chat, like some of the things that come to your mind. If you're gonna say, what has COVID made me rethink? And uh, the panelists like Martin and Terry, I hope you're here because I wanna hear from you too. I don't know if, you've, uh, if you'd say you've, you've said that in your, your keynotes already or not. I'll pause for a second and wait for the chat. It's gonna be difficult for me to check Twitter, but I'm trying to check the chat, so. Hi, Lisa Marie. <laughs> I'm sorry that Anna's feeling sadness. So Martin is saying that a massive uptake of online is going to be an, uh, a paradigm shift of sorts. Alexandra, hi, Alexandra. People start sharing ideas and practices more. Hope this is here to stay. Yes, I agree with you. This has been wonderful to see. People who have not previously been sharing openly has have started to much more than usual. And Jose says, extended the work already done with students, rethinking social interactions, recognizing my immediate social circle. Oh, Jay saying institution has been in panic, you have to find a new job, I'm sorry. The, I mean, this the economic impact is, is not small on, on people's um, job stability sometimes. Terry saying that huge educational institutions can move swiftly. Yes, that's a good one. Usually they're so slow to get anything done. And then all of a sudden, oh, fun. You know, they've been resisting online learnings for years. And now all of a sudden they can do it. And now it's okay. And it's the same quality and students should pay the same fees. So that's an interesting thing. Um, yeah, panic, panic, I think, was a normal reaction, I think. Um, Probably those of us who are into e-learning for a long time were less panicked than everyone else, but it's understandable why everyone else would have been panicked. Were you thinking how to teach primary students online? I think this this one we need to spend a lot of time on, this young students. I have a daughter who's eight, and I, yeah, that's a big deal. And Deborah saying that we're not a niche field. I've been thinking of this too. Experiences, we had something that now everyone feels like they've now experienced online learning and they know how to do it. And like all this stuff that we've been learning for years is, is not relevant to them anymore. And we're, we're not, we don't know something that they don't know anymore. <laughs> That's true. And a master in video conferencing is the only, yes, I'm gonna talk about that. Yes, yes. 
Yes. Widespread creation of resources. So that, yeah, I agree that's a good thing. More teamwork for design. Yeah, we're mainstream now. We're like the traditionalists now. We're not progressive anymore. <laughs> okay, I'm going to move on. So I, I did share on Twitter. Um, and I, for me, one of the main, uh, it's not really a paradigm shift in the sense that it already existed, but the importance of the socio-emotional dimension of digital literacy is being more essential than usual. Um, for me, I think it's more important, not because it wasn't there, it was always there in online learning. The, the social aspect uh, was always yeah, core to online learning. These constructivist and connectivist approaches to online learning are all about that. And we who have been in online learning have known about this forever. The difference is, when we did online learning, we also had our face-to-face -face life going on at the same time. When I did my master's online, I had my full-time job where I went and I met people. I did my PhD where I met my supervisor a few times a year, but most of the time I went to work and I saw people every day. Uh, but with the trauma and the social distancing of, of COVID-19 plus the cognitive load of, of this very stressful time, the, the importance of teachers uh, providing space for expressing and discussing their emotions and providing an emotionally safe space for students became more important for different reasons. And they were not equipped to do that. And that's why they felt like synchronous might be the way to do it. But I also believe in a lot of the importance of semi-synchronous third places, which I'll come back to in a minute. So um, this, this obviously, um, aside from the community of inquiry model, which all of us know about, there's also Cleveland Innocent Campbell in 2012 who talked about emotional presence separately from social presence, because if you're not careful, social presence can be just socialization without making room for the expression of emotion and care. And I think that, that there's value in separating those out. So socio and emotional, they're not one thing and they won't automatically both happen together. Um, and then there was this other realization which came up in several different spaces, but here Virginia Yonkers is mentioning it, is the, in online learning, we're very used to a lot of asynchronous, like synchronous was happening, of course, but online learning was usually designed to be mainly asynchronous, mainly flexible so that people can do whatever, whatever whenever. Um, but the synchronous became important and a lot of us in e-learning were like, you guys don't understand, e-learning doesn't have to be like that. But in reality, because there was no face-to-face -face social, the synchronous had to be online. And, and so the social had to be synchronous online to a lot of people. Um, and that a lot of undergraduate students to be able to manage their time in this new mode of learning in this trauma, they weren't ready for that. And actually, when you think about it, the teachers as well, because asynchronous takes a lot more time to, to manage uh, and a lot more thought. Uh, and nobody had that time or, or the space to think about all of that. Um, and so, yeah, because as Pauline Ridley is saying, there was no face-to-face -face synchronous, so you had to think about that. The other thing is, you know, I was just saying asynchronous requires time management autonomy from students, and that's much more difficult for younger students. Building community was always possible online. It became more important than ever. But it's, it's the ways in which, um, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit, is just the ways in which synchronous was a lower cognitive load for people makes a huge difference. Um, and we'll talk about the equity issues there. Um, I'm going to be mentioning a lot of research that I've been involved in here, but I'm gonna be touching upon it because for me, I think what was more important to spend my summertime uh, was not doing research, even though I have a lot of research in the works, but I wanted to work on what people needed. And I chose to spend August creating community building resources for teachers who don't know how to do so online because I realized that no matter how much I talk to them about how community building online is possible and I try to send them resources, they needed to see it. And so this, if you haven't seen this uh, resource, I'm gonna, whoops, all right, I clicked on it by mistake. I did not mean to do that, but that's not a bad thing. I'm going to try to type it into the chat so that folks can take a look at it. It just gives people ideas of resources of you know how would you uh, build community online, like specific resources they can look at and videos and adaptations and how would you adapt it if your students can't be synchronous and things like that. So I'm just wondering, for me, what was happening is people are going to be synchronous anyway. They don't know how to use it the best way possible. So why not give them ideas? If you're going to be synchronous, here are some ways to make use of that time together to really build community and really listen to students and make this experience interactive instead of getting, getting online and and just lecturing or doing breakout rooms, for example, but not giving students something very specific to do in the breakout rooms. And so 
Um, one of the ways I do it is with using uh, these techniques called liberating structures, which I will mention again um, later. But that's the important thing. If this is where people are at, if this is what teachers are willing to do, they're not willing to do to put in the time. And I understand it's not it's just an unwillingness. It's <laughs> you don't have time and they don't have the cognitive space to design a proper online course in the ways that we've so decided that online courses should be beforehand, then let's make the best of what we have now and make the synchronous time count and make it matter and make it worthwhile. And those semi-synchronous third places are great because if you have something like a WhatsApp group or a Slack team or something or Google Docs, you're allowing people to participate synchronously or asynchronously and that creates a kind of equity that you couldn't do. Um, so even though asynchronous learning, of course, is more accessible in general for people with uh, poor infrastructure or people whose time is not very flexible, like working parents um, and so on, synchronous does work better for many who can access it and on a socio-emotional level and lower cognitive load because not everyone knows how to manage their time or express their emotions online. Um, and so this whole trauma-informed approach has been really helpful for me during this pandemic. And I learned from Maisa Ahmed and Karen Costa about this. It's helped me as a teacher and as a mom and as someone who's also creating a lot of care communities for others. Um, and to realize that we are in a pandemic now, probably when this is over, there will be a lot of emotional damage for a lot of people to different degrees. Obviously, it's not equally distributed, but this is a moment where everyone has a little bit of this, right? And that flexible online learning is is better for everyone, not just for those who are disadvantaged. But then it's also important to think about equity literacy and that not everyone is in the same space, right? So first of all, uh, what Tutalini Asino is saying over here is that a lot of the divisions between developing and developed worlds are not useful so much right now. There is sort of the, the privileged and the less privileged in every space. So it's not that yeah, I know, for example, there, and we'll talk about this later, there are rural spaces in Canada that don't have internet connectivity, where Cairo here in Egypt has good connectivity, but there are other spaces here that don't, right? Because online and the pandemic have not been equalizers. They've just actually revealed and revealed and reproduced a lot of inequalities and injustices, and you have to look at them in a lot of different spaces. But a lot of things that people who previously had been privileged and, and Paris Mehran is talking about passport privilege, the ability to move between countries and the mobility to do that, now everyone knows how it feels not to be able to move from one country to another comfortably. And uh, Paris is saying the world has always been COVID-ish for us. I think she made up that term. And so it's important when we talk about equity and social justice to look at all the different dimensions of it. There are the economic dimensions where we talk about a lot in, in ed tech about access to the technology and the devices, but there's also cultural and political dimensions. And when we talk about something like open educational resources and their existence, whose culture is represented in these open educational resources and the political dimension of who has the right to choose how we will do things. So for example, a lot of institutions did move quickly online, but at, Terry was saying this, right? But at the risk or at the cost of not uh, having a very good process of involving professors in the choice of how are we going to move online. And so sometimes institutions, including mine, initially would say, oh, we're going to teach you how to use the learning management system, the lecture capture system. And then teachers were like, but I don't lecture. How am I going to use this? And for me, it's very important to, to give uh, teachers agency so that they can learn to give their students agency as well and to make sure that cultural representation is equitably distributed and that marginal groups are represented. Um, and so someone in the chat earlier, when, when Martin was talking about wikis, uh, we mentioned Wikipedia. And one of the things about Wikipedia is that theoretically, of course, economically, it's a good space because it's a free encyclopedia, right? You don't have to pay to get there. As, as long as you have internet, you can reach it. But culturally and politically, it's problematic because we know that the representation of white male points of view and biographies and so on is much stronger there. And then who are the editors who have the political power to edit things out and to refuse the biographies that you add are, are mostly also white male. So these are things to think about, even when we talk about something being open, uh, and that there are a lot of resources shared, which part of the world are these resources shared from, in which language is it shared, and how is who has access to that language, and then who has whose culture is represented in everything that we, we, we are now saying is open. So I'm just going to ask you to think about this, like what kind of example of pedagogies do you know or that have happened during the pandemic that you feel can empower or privilege one group in one context, but also disadvantage another group? I'll pause for a second um, to see if people have something to share here. Oh. 
Okay, nobody's typing right now, but you can keep typing if you're thinking about these th the things. The paper that I mentioned over here by um, Rajiv Jangani, Catherine Cronin, and myself talks about how open educational practices can seem to be promoting social justice for one in one day, one dimension, but not in another. Synchronous sessions, yeah, exactly. I think synchronous sessions are definitely one of those spaces. Like um, everyone who has an internet connection probably finds it easier to do a synchronous learning experience than to do asynchronous. And Paris people don't have other commitments. That's true. So people who have care work, time is not equal for, for people, right? Breakout sessions doing live events. If you have a very slow connection, the breakout sessions don't work out very well. Uh, you can get disconnected sometimes. But otherwise, it's really enabling a better conversation, right, in smaller groups. Um, I think you're right that all pedagogies empower and privilege uh, one group day. It's what I'm saying is that sometimes you're doing something that is meant to promote equity, but then by mistake, you're you're still going to miss someone in that process. It's, it's, I think it's a never ending struggle, right? Um, inequalities become more obvious. I agree. As soon as you start putting technology, it's not that inequalities weren't there, but they're stronger. So, for example, in South Africa, some of the inequalities became really obvious because people had at least access to technology and Internet on campus, and then suddenly they didn't. So the fact that they lived in homes that didn't have good Internet became more obvious or they didn't have their own devices became more obvious. Yeah. All right. And some icebreaker activities. Thank you, Martin. So in, in our community building resources, uh, we have a section called safety considerations, which Kate Bowles uh, gave. Um, and wrote, um, and she's talking about even when you're doing a community building activity that maybe 90% of people will enjoy, there will be some people for whom it's unsafe and you have to be really careful about how to do that. Um, and Terry's saying men dominate synchronous online conversation as they usually do F to F. Yes, they dominate everything. That's true. <laughs> Um, all right, so context is really necessary for any discussion about all of this. Um, same action or intervention can marginalize one group of privilege another. This is a doodle by my daughter who is bilingual. She speaks English and Arabic. And in Arabic, you can read from right to left or from left to right. And when I saw this doodle, I asked her, which direction are you supposed to read it? And she said, well, if you read it from right to left, this is the story. And then if you read it from left to right, this is the story. So she has two stories going at the same time. And I think we need to have room in our postmodern brains to recognize that this story looks different from different directions, from different angles, depending on who you are. Sometimes the thing that's really working well for the teacher isn't working well for the student, or the thing that is working for one student obviously is not working for another. I know I'm overemphasizing this, but it's really important to, to just keep thinking about the ways this is happening. Um, and so, for example, talking about economic injustice uh, and how that can influence cultural injustice as well. I'm thinking about indigenous populations in Canada. These are shared by Tannis Morgan and Tanya Elias and ways in which, um, if you see the image on the right, this is an actress who is from, I don't know how to pronounce this, Iqaluit um, tribe, I'm guessing, in Canada, one of the indigenous tribes. And she barely made it to the deadline to make it to apply for to be to have a role in a movie. So the fact that she her internet is slow was stopping her from even just applying for the opportunity that she wanted to be part of. Um, and this one, the other one from Tennis Morgan, um, this Casey, who's a digital innovator, is able to create um, art artwork using virtual reality, which represents his culture. But most people from his own culture don't have a fast enough internet connection to benefit from what he's doing. That's what he's talking about in that video. So that's really important to think about that. Um, and one of the funny things that happened during this Twitter conversation is that they kept talking about how the North is reaching the world. And in my context as a global South person, the North is the dominant white male type of culture. But they were actually talking about the Northern territories in Canada, the Northwest territories in Canada, who are uh, less privileged and, and less reachable because they are, you know. So it's, it's very interesting that just using even the geographic term North is tricky, right? So it needs to be very careful. Um, this is one of my favorite uh, diagrams. You've probably seen it or seen one similar to it before, differentiating equity and equality and the importance of trying to um, ensure that we don't forget equity while we're just focusing on equality. But I think not everyone wants an apple, so it's important to offer something different. Um, and that sometimes someone is privileged in one way, but maybe they need care and not apples today. So just think about that. The important thing is to give people a uh, parity of participation, give them the choice to, to choose what they want and don't just give them the crumbs. I love this quote by Desmond Tutu. Um, I think giving students and teachers 
the full menu of rights, but also letting them choose their own menu and their own ingredients. And don't just tell them, oh, this is what you're going to get. Now choose from what I've given you. You need to allow them to choose what they want to include. So when, you know, when, when institutions tell teachers you have to use only the LMS, that's highly problematic. Like maybe they have another way to engage students that better fits their own um, teaching philosophy. I'm going to run through the intentionally equitable hospitality aspect. Um, this is a paper that I co-authored with my colleagues at Virtually Connecting, and it's about the teacher as the host uh, and making sure they listen. Who do they listen to as they design their courses and making sure you set the intention to be equitable because it's not going to happen by coincidence. And that the equity aspect means paying attention to every each and every student's needs and not all students, which is a lot of hard work. But how do we research this stuff and whose stories and on whose terms are we doing this? And I believe that autoethnography is one of the best ways to research this kind of thing, because there's a lot of ambiguities and uncertainties. And a lot of things are happening online and offline. It's not just online. If you research only public Twitter, you don't really know what's happening in the private conversations. And you don't know what's happening offline away from Twitter altogether that you cannot research in that way. So I've got a chapter on uh, doing autoethnography on the Internet uh, recently published that talks about this. And the assumption is that you cannot categorize people. The other is never fully knowable from, a, from afar. You don't even even fully know yourself, but at least you can express where you're coming from and why you're doing things in certain ways. So, for example, when COVID happened, happened in Egyptian schools, they started to assign projects instead of exams, which sounds like very good pedagogy, right? It's more authentic. Uh, they're learning research skills, which is like, wow. But actually, neither the teachers nor the students had ever done this before. Nobody knew how to do this. Nobody was prepared to do it. And suddenly they had to learn to do it during a pandemic where the teachers couldn't explain to students how to use the Internet properly, how to use scholarly resources or anything. So it was a nice idea, but in practice, it was highly problematic. Um, another thing that I think became really important for me during uh, COVID was the importance of global and open professional development. Like there's no reason not to open up a lot of what, what we do for professional development to people from other countries. Uh, or at least even locally across institutions. Um, and this is a research I did with Daniela Gashago and Nicola Pallet from uh, South Africa, which was a collaborative autoethnography about no size fits all, where it's a little similar to what Terry and uh, John John were doing in terms of like looking at different dimensions of what uh, an online or networked experience could be. But in ours, we were saying like, these are different dimensions. And of course can be any of those things. And it's really important to, First of all, recognize that different teachers may need different amounts of freedom and amounts of structure in order to learn, right? Do they have an autonomous learning path or do we all need to follow the same path, for example? Or is there something in between like a dual pathway? It's important to think about these things. And that a course can be process or content centric. And this applies both to professional development and the courses that teachers teach as well, right? Um, so the important thing is how can we, uh, if we are people who are supporting others to teach online, how can we give them choice and give them multiple pathways? And Matt Crossland has experienced uh, this and, and has experimented with this in several different books and he's talked about it. Um, and Autumn Keynes and I have published about the importance of promoting equity and ownership and agency in faculty development using connected learning um, and then using that as the way to help teachers learn and how we model for teachers giving choices to their own students. I know I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm going to skip these particular examples um, and just talk about whose labor are we valuing in this pandemic. This has been always important, but more, more um, visible, I think, and some things of it are invisible. I, I have a lot of respect for teachers and professors who managed to go online with little or no preparation for this. Uh, these are traumatic times, and they've had family and psychological and additional pressures, so it has not been an easy time to adapt to something completely foreign to a lot of people. Um, but then how much agency and support did institutions offer teachers in order to embody their own teaching philosophy online so that it's not a horrible experience for them and their students? And when we talk about alternative assessments, it's really, I strongly agree that we want people to do alternative assessments rather than standardized tests and proctoring, but how much help does it need to change someone's mindset in the midst of a pandemic? to rethink something so big that they hadn't thought about before, even though it's good pedagogy, even though I think they should keep doing it beyond the pandemic. It was just a difficult time to do this. Um, but I also want to recognize something really important here, and I'm sure a lot of you are in this situation where you are the administrative staff who are really keeping the ship afloat. So it's not enough to thank the teachers for the work that they've done. There's been a big burden of shifting online on people who are ed tech experts. And they're, 
they're visible to the teachers, but sometimes administrators or people outside are looking at the teachers and not looking at the amount of work we've been doing to support uh, the, the work online. So this quote is from uh, Laura Chernovich and a lot of others in African, South African institutions talking about the shift to online and, and the kind of work that's been going there. And it's not just that we've given them training on how to go online. We've been doing a lot of effective labor. We've been educational developers caring for the teachers so they can care for students. Uh, part of it is just to keep them going, but it's been a lot of pressure on us too, right? And, and we still have to care for our own families, so it's not been easy. Uh, and that's why centering our values has become really important. I think both Terry and, and Martin have, have mentioned this, um, you know, that edtech is not neutral and technologies can reinforce, reproduce or amplify things like cultural surveillance, control, inequalities. Um, so which of your values have become central during this pandemic? Um, if you have bandwidth to write about this, type it in the chat. I'm about to finish. Um, Verna Rossi was talking about the importance of centering pedagogy of care. And uh, Tanya is again talking about, you know, how education systems are heavily centered around control. And it's really important as teachers who don't do that, who want to keep doing this, is this really what they want to teach their students? Are we preparing learners for the world as it is, especially when we talk about academic integrity? Are we preparing the world, learners for the world as it is? Or are we preparing them to be agents who can imagine the world as it could be? And so for me, if I, you know, you can say that you want to prepare students for a horrible world and a cruel world out there, or you can help them become people who will make that world a better place. And this sounds very idealistic, but I think every teacher has the responsibility and room to, to sort of think about how to do that. And I'm going to leave you with these quotes about hope. My voice is disappearing on me, so I'm just going to put them up on the screen and not read them out loud. Okay, I've coughed a little bit and had a drink of water. Um, thinking about how hope is so important to have right now, but it sometimes can feel wrong because you know you might be supporting a broken system. There's a lot happening in our institutions that we may not be happy with. Uh, and it's difficult to even know what's right and what's wrong and what's the best way forward. Um, and, and then I think the importance of having communities um, and continue to, to be critical of systemic injustice, but still to be insistent about hope and then hope for probably equity oriented change. I hope is something that um, a lot of us still hold hope for and are, and you, you know, hope is not a passive thing that you just have and just do nothing about. If you have hope for something to change, like think about what it is that you can do to bring about the changes that you're hoping for. And I am about to finish now. Yes, I think it's a beautiful quote from Laura et al. So there's like, I think, 20 authors for that article uh, that I'm quoting over here. Yes, all the evil came out. At the bottom, there was hope. I love that, Anna. Thank you for sharing that. I didn't know that about Pandora's box. All right. Thank you very much for listening. I think I just took my time. Thank you very much, Ma. Very, um, very interesting and engaging uh, presentation. I think uh, a lot of the sentiment there is uh, things we can really identify with uh, at these times that we're, we're in at the moment. Um, just one quick question before we move on to the question and answer session, where you'll have another opportunity to answer more questions. And um, that was really about, um, of all the stuff you've written, one of the things I particularly liked was your pedagogy of care. And when you updated it for the, the, the COVID edition, and um, because uh, we've been using, uh, in my group, we've been using MOOCs for working for social inclusion with refugees, for example, and we could really identify that. One thing I, I would like to ask you about, though, is how, how do you see the scalability in this kind of approach to online learning? Because what you can do with a small number of students in terms of uh, empathic identification of emotional states, it's kind of a lot harder when you've got large numbers of students. Yeah. Yeah, I get asked that a lot. <laughs> so yeah, yeah this question. kind of care, care does it's a good question, right? I think care doesn't scale in the sense that one person cannot show the same amount of care to a million people, but I think care distributes. So you can distribute the care so that there are small, uh, you know, small communities of ten people who are caring for each other and supporting each other. I think it, it, it seems like we're putting maybe pressure on students to do that for each other sometimes, but I think. 
that's the kind of human being I think they should be. So if you're working in a large institution, you want the professors in the department to support each other, not just to require that support from the president of the institution, right? If you're working in a large faculty that has different sub departments. So in the same way, I think with students, if you're, if you're teaching 200 students, of course you can't pay attention to every single one of them. You can do surveys and you can find out uh, roughly what's happening, but you can also encourage both having teaching assistants, but also encourage the students with each other and create spaces for them to, to support each other and make time for that. So you can make the time or, or design the spaces that promote that. And so doing something like a Slack team and giving them uh, different channels to work on where you're not as a teacher participating in every single thing. Um, making breakout groups and maybe making them consistently in the same breakout room rooms for some sessions in a row asking them specifically to give peer feedback, asking them specifically to ask about each other. Those are the kinds of things I think. So just distributing that care, delegating. I think this was something I think Terry mentioned is delegating the care down uh, so that it's happening everywhere and not the responsibility of just one person who has a lot of power, but just the responsibility of everyone. I hope that helps. It does. That was very, very interesting. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, we're moving on to the question and answer session now. So if the speakers can reactivate their cameras and, uh, and microphones, and I'd also like to ask my, uh, my colleague, um, Joseph Duat, to, to do the same. Yeah. You just popped out there, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had to turn that light off. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, thank you very much. Right. Um, okay, let's get uh, let's get going then. Um, the the talks have all been very interesting, and I think uh, we've seen a lot of uh, topic over, topics over the last few days about um, the role of from um, uh, tech in or an online learning and stuff in um, in this time of, uh, of the pandemic. I mean. How do you think the um, what we've seen and what people are, are doing is gonna is gonna play out over the next series of months and years? Because depending on how the how when the vaccine and vaccination becomes available, we might be at the beginning of next year, quite possibly the following year before we all have it. So I mean, a lot of teaching teachers have been forced online, kicking and screaming. So I mean, how can we see now they're beginning to get a a taste for it? Do you think uh, this is going to affect the way they work, or do you think with time we'll a lot of people just go back and do the way things the way they did before. Um, okay, um, can I start with Terry there, please? Sure. Um, well, I'm, I'm, I, I imagine that the teachers will uh, run back to the to the campuses and uh, and be thank God this is over. Kind of feeling a lot of them will, but I, I think they might have a lot less students in front of them because I start, I think people start to realize that the, the options that are available with online learning, uh, that they, they, they are starting to realize, hmm, you know, that wasn't such a bad thing. I could stay home and look care of my mom or my kids or, or, or keep my job or blah, blah, blah. And they're starting to, you know, sort of, it's, it's opened, it's, certainly it's opened uh, teacher's eyes, but uh, the impact on the students and then especially in North America where we're, we're and maybe globally, where we're really driven by students' bucks and how many are enrolling. And uh, I, I think it's going to be a, a sort of long lasting uh, uh, impact. Yeah. Yeah, I think you you could be right there, Martin. Don't add anything. I mean, I think Terry's right. I think there'll be a mixture of reactions. I think there'll be a backlash, and we'll go. Oh, we tried that online; it was terrible. Let's go back to face to face on campus. I think other people, and I think particularly learners, will find enjoy some of the flexibility. I hate to be one of those speakers who extrapolates from a. A sample of one but my daughter's at university now at the moment and she's like the first year she, she texts me the other day like i've got a 10 o'clock lecture i got up at 10 to 10 it's great why weren't we doing this all the time so she's enjoying it but i think uh, you know to go to uh Martha's talk i think you know i think what might be more impactful is just i think the kind of you know mental health impact on, on all of this stuff you know and where we where we feel when we sit at the end of it um you know, more seriously, like, I'm in Wales, we're just going into a second lockdown now, and I think the second one feels a lot tougher than the first one, you know, it's like, I'm not sure when it's going to end. So I think when we come out at the end of it, there'll be a lot of, there'll be a long tail of effects, I think, very kind of human effects, I think, of how we conduct education and those kind of things. Mm. 
Um, I'll just jump in right away. Yeah. So um, I think one of the issues, I think, is the trauma of experiencing online learning during a traumatic time. And a lot of people's minds will be tied together. Whether or not you had a good teaching ex or online experience is just that online learning will remind a lot of people <laughs> of the pandemic. And I'm kind of worried about that in a, on a subliminal level. I don't think on a, on a conscious level even. Um, but I, I do from teachers uh, and my institution, especially because I think we did a good job helping them out, those who did come <laughs> for help. We spent the whole summer teaching them how to teach better online and engage students and things like that. A lot of them are coming back and saying a lot of what I've learned, I'm going to use even when I go face to face. So it's not that they're planning to teach online more, but to teach face to face better and to make better use of technology when they can. And uh, I, I think uh, students may be feeling different again because of the socio-emotional aspect that they're missing. Um, but I, what the, the dimension that I think will, I hope, definitely continue without any bad effects is this global local professional development thing where it's going to be in the past uh, when when someone invited me to a keynote and everyone knows this I would only say yes to about one out of ten because I couldn't travel all the time now because everything's online I can't say no because I can do all these keynotes and I'm thinking about like this space where you have Terry from Canada and Martin from the UK and myself from Egypt it's much more expensive to do this face to face all the time and those of us who do online stuff and of course Eden is one of them we do a lot of these th things all the time online you're doing more of them and everyone's doing them and then all the communities are doing them and you're seeing the value of this global kind of communication and we're learning how to do it better too because it used to happen before and it's getting better it's getting more engaging so i think that one i hope stays forever it sort of promotes a lot of equity in the professional development of of educators who don't normally either because of their location or their finances could not um, attend as many of these yeah, that's a, a good point. I must admit that um, I've also got three children in in education in different stage, two in university, one at school, and um, it's hard because you're giving support on uh, one stage while you're trying to teach on on the other. So it's actually difficult. Okay, um, so we've been forced online, and um, things are, are moving a lot quicker. And I heard someone over the past couple of days say that that's actually uh, caused an acceleration that we've seen in the way that um, edtech has been adopted. That may have taken perhaps five years or more to have been undertaken in the in, in ordinary conditions, which is presumably a, a good thing. But what I'd like to ask you, and Maha, we'll start with you. Um, do you think that we'll see um, the quality of the process and the, our techniques evolve at the same way, or will we still be blundering on in the in the same way we are at the moment? You, uh, the quality of the techniques where in this just the online learning we're doing during the pandemic. You mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would hope people are still learning from. There, there's this combination of people learning from their experience and from their colleagues and the sharing that um, others have said has increased over time. Um, and at the same time, the exhaustion and the, the situation like you're in, like having children and working and doing all of that might become more exhausting. It might become more of a, of a burden. But I, I do think there, I think what I'm seeing, so this is theoretically speaking, I was worried that this would not be happening. But what I'm seeing around me is that the anyone who's been trying to make an effort has been getting better at this. There are a few people who are still resistant and not getting better at it. Um, perhaps institutions will get better at trying to reach people who don't want to be reached. Because in the past, a lot of us who work in educational technology, we only worked with people who signed up for online or blended learning because they wanted to do it for a reason that they knew either they believed in it or there was a good logistical reason. Now everyone has the reason, but it's not a reason they chose. Um, and so some people have been open-minded about this uh, and some people have not. And the ones who have not, and they're continuing to just stick to whatever they, they want to do, I don't know if that's going to, I don't know what we can do about that, really. I don't know if Terry and Martin have ideas for this. Okay, uh, Terry? Yeah, well, I think that uh, if you look at, at the example of the uh, the examination assessment, the uh, high stakes tests that have been the bread and butter for institutions uh, for, for years, and especially in our distance ed world, uh, uh, you know, you, you see armed guards going out with the exams and this sort of thing. Um, but it, they don't really work very well online. And uh, so what am I going to do? Have no assessment? That's not acceptable. So, uh, it, you know, that, that kind of uh, impact, uh, I, I think, will, will be positive uh, pedagogically anyways. Okay. Ma Martin? Yeah, I think um, um, it's been covered really, but I, I think what you see is 
some educators will be thinking, okay, I, I think perhaps more institutions than anything, if, if institutions will start to think, even if it's not, even this pandemic goes away, there might be other ones, or there might be other factors. It might be, you know, Terry talked about, you know, trying to think about climate change and bringing people to, in one place. So I think we might see institutions starting to think, how do we devise a more robust uh, system? And I mentioned that, you know, um, the exam is a, is a weak point in, in that, but I think also just having everyone come to one place, I think trying to develop a more blended approach would be something that institutions start to push. And then um, I think a lot of educators will come on board then. And I think lots of them will have enjoyed some of the experience as well, you know, been able to teach online and they, they'll want to kind of get better with it. You know, and I think, um, I think just like a lot of students will think, actually, I quite like giving lectures from my house, from, <laughs> but they might want to do different things and, and they'll get feedback from students. So I think, you know, you'll have some of that feedback coming through. So I think it will take sort of two or three iterations to get to get there. But it depends, as Maha says, whether people are just exhausted by that time and just don't have the capacity. Hmm. Yeah. Can I just follow up quickly on something Maha said uh, earlier that, you know, this fact that we can do professional development at a distance at a much lower cost now than, than we could in her keynotes uh, example. But I wonder if we reflect on that, you know, how many people are at this Eden uh, workshop conference and registered and uh, I don't know, actually, is it a lot more or a lot less? I see 45, 45, 50 people at the closing, you know, is, I, I can't remember. I thought it was bigger, but then of course it's, things change besides just uh, going online. But uh, to repeat what I said earlier, I guess at the start is that I, I think we really seriously have to think about how we support uh, distance and learners uh, or online learners and, and teachers uh, in our professional organizations and try to find ways to make uh, the online conferences work better. Yeah, there's um, I don't know the exact number, but there's several hundred registered at the conference. But I mean, I personally, I've been to quite a few um, online conferences since the, the since um, March, April. And um, it's been difficult because in some ways, it's a bit of a luxury going off to a conference because you put your life on hold. You say, bye bye, kids. Bye bye. You know, you don't have to worry about attending your students or anything. You're at a conference and it's it's just absolutely wonderful because you're, it's all the informal conversations over coffee and stuff and, and just being cocooned from, from this environment. And when you do this online, it's actually really hard because I could tell you all the horror stories I personally had when you're trying to, to moderate or give a talk and then suddenly somebody opens the door and the dog comes in and he's jumping up on you because he wants a biscuit and you, you can't pay any attention because you've got a lot of people trying to listen to you and your concentration goes and, uh, and it's difficult. So uh, it's actually difficult. OK, so I think this is interesting what, what Martin was saying. I mean, in a way, our institutions do need to support us. I mean, perhaps I mean, I'm at a distance university or uh, similar to the one that Martin's at. So, I mean, I do feel supported. I mean, I'm definitely not going to stay as I don't. But I'm not sure that's always the case. I mean, we did these these webinars in Eden for online in times of pandemic. And uh, with some of the feedback we were getting from the uh, the, the, the people who were, were connecting in is they didn't really feel supported. I mean, if we're going to be moving towards this, this new normal or whatever you want to call it, and we're not necessarily going to be going back to the way we were um, teaching and interacting before what kind of support should our um our institutions really be uh, giving us uh, ma would you like to start yeah i mean one of the things it's sort of related i was responding to terry actually but it, i think it helps respond to yours as well when i say global so i'm not talking about completely global one of the things that we thought had been useful is to we i was part of um, a global uh, thing called ditch pins uh, so they it's a, it's a kind, of, kind of connected learning, but with some support type of professional development experience that's a month long. Um, and what we had is like, you had a person from each institution who's responsible for the cohorts from their institution. So they have that local support. And then you had activities where they interacted with people from all over the world, some of them synchronous and some of them asynchronous, and you could dip in and out. And having that agency, but some structure and then also some local support. So we met sometimes just the local folks um, and then sometimes with everyone else and going back and forth between those layers, um, I think is one of the things to keep in mind because yeah, just I think what we've got right now is like we're all bombarded by so much professional development. There's I have three conferences this week. Yeah, 
and and today I just came from like a full day workshop into this keynote. So yeah, it's it's a little bit crazy, and I can't focus on what you're talking about. Focus not even with my kid around or not around. Just the ability to focus in general. I think with the pandemic and just being online all the time is just. Um, so we yeah, I think we do need to think about like one of the things we're doing in my department is saying we're going to do half hour workshops, whereas in the summer we were doing three hour workshops, intensive. When the semester started, people started to know. And we're like, oh, let's do half hour workshops. Like just teach me one thing in half an hour and then we can go. <laughs> so that, those are things I think we need to keep um, iterating on. Okay, thank you. Terry, what do you think the, the work-life balance and how to manage this, uh, this stress? Well, I'm retired, so I'm not really in a position to, <laughs> to, to comment with much authority on that. But um, <clears throat> yeah, it, 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 it is true that uh, I, I pick up on my house point that this idea of uh, of uh, having a local group, uh, you know, sort of to to allow that kind of um, uh, con uh, collaborative construction of, of knowledge and meaning, but have it uh, enriched by uh, people from Egypt or from anywhere or Iqaluit uh, or anywhere in the world, I think is, is really useful for all of us. So a, a good point. Thanks, Martin. On the um, work-life balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting. Um, I think what working at home is revealing is lots of things that we kind of took for granted before, uh, bad things as well. Like, so uh, I live in Cardiff, for instance, and I used to go up once a week, once or twice a week to Milton Keynes, which is about 150 miles away. And I did that drive the other day to go and see someone. And I thought, I'm not doing this drive anymore. Like, I'm, I'm not spending six hours of a day in a car, like stuck on motorways and stuff. And it, and it just felt awful. You know, it kind of felt like bad for my mental health. And also often you're doing it when you're tired. And you know, there's lots of kind of you know, stats on, you know, accidents that are caused by tiredness and drowsiness. And you think, like, we were doing all this stuff. And, and the amount of time wasted. So I think it reveals those kind of things. But at the same time, it also reveals plenty of kind of inequality. You know, like people who don't have a nice office, they can sit in separately like I do. Or, uh, you know, I've got young children and stuff. So I think... So I think it's like all this stuff. So I'm coming around to the point of view, there's good and bad to it, which is a bit, a bit of a twee conclusion, but I think it's interesting. I know. But I think what is interesting are the kind of things we just took for granted or spending thousands of pounds a year to commute on trains in a miserable setting to go into an office where you sort of couldn't get any work done. So. Yeah. Okay, thank you. No, Ma, you didn't uh, answer that one question. That was, uh, that was a good... Uh... A good uh, answer you, you gave us. Okay, so I mean, what's in some respect maybe it's because we're educationalists and we're at a, an educational uh, conference where we're we're somewhat myopically focusing on what's happening in our particular area, and we're or maybe at least I am. I don't want to put words into your mouth, but we're kind of assuming that we're we're teaching and training our students so that uh, once we get over this minor hiccup they'll be back to normal in, in, in going into their, their companies every day and working in the old fashioned uh, way. Do you think there's gonna be some kind of, um, if you like transition from the way they were working before to a new way of working that's actually reflecting what we're teaching them. So in a way, we don't have to feel guilty about um, using all these online techniques to teach them because that in itself is a useful skill for them in their, in their professional life. Martin, do you wanna pick it up first? Yeah, I think that sort of links back to point I was just making before I think you know I think actually lots of people will be looking to have be able to work from home after this you know and I think you know so, um, it will be a good year now before many of us go back on into campus or into offices and think well if I've been doing my job perfectly well for that time why is it you need me to be in the office now so I think lots of people will want that flexibility and I think others will really want to be in an office and have that kind of social life you know, I think it'll be a mixture but that's I think you get you open it up for different people to apply for jobs when you, you sort of get to work online and be home based. So I think you know you're absolutely right. You know, there's a certain skill and responsibility in organising your time, being able to study. You know, when you're not, when the architecture doesn't do that work for you, I think. And so those kind of skills will be sort of mapped across a lot to be able to work remotely, which I think will be much more the normal. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Terry. 
Yeah, I, I just picking up on Martin's example of the commute. I, I'm glad I don't. In, I'm not an investor in uh, commercial office space because uh, there's a lot of people who are just not going to go drive two hours a day for for a commute, especially when they now realize and their bosses realize that uh, this can work. That doesn't mean that they're not going to come for the Christmas party and uh, to, to, to enjoy a little social interaction with their colleagues, but uh, they're going to realize that uh, you can separate the two and, uh, and, and achieve a balance uh, uh, for you personally, but as well uh, a, a balance that, that will uh, enhance your productivity or your learning or your teaching. Yeah. That's a, a good uh, observation. Maha? I was just saying, Deborah, in the chat, saying mm -hmm. that uh, there was a recent survey in the UK where only 7% of HE students thought working online with other students was useful. But I think that's probably because they've just not had a good experience of it. But <laughs> I do tell my students, you know, even before COVID, uh, if you work in a multinational context, you will need to interact with people online and you will have to figure out ways to learn with others online, even, even if there wasn't any of this. Um, but um, the other aspect of it is that not only, yeah, I think the important part is that the employers are realizing that remote work actually is valuable, whereas before there was a lot of resistance to remote work, right? Like, oh, they're not sure what the employees are going to be doing. Now they know that employees can do it and they let them do it. Um, and so this is a kind of freedom that students would have in the future if they only, you know, could take advantage of it and they'll know the value of it when they are no longer uh, young and when they have families and they have these other responsibilities and when they want to study, you know, when they, when they want to work and study at the same time, once they start to have that multiple, uh, right now they don't have that. So I don't think they can imagine why, why it's so important. Uh, some of them do obviously if they're mature students, but you know, younger students may not realize the value of it until later. So I try to bring that into my class right now and tell students, you know, actually you realize this is going to use this later. And for example, um, I don't force my students ever to turn their camera on, but I told them you realize that maybe in your future you will need to present something online to people. So you need to start getting comfortable with that. How can we work towards that so that when you have to do it in a high stakes context, you're not nervous anymore um, about it, for example. Yeah, thanks very much. I mean, I saw Deborah's comment as well, and I think that's that's very interesting. But I think that tells more about perceptions of students to begin with, because, I mean, there are a lot of skills there. I mean, I used to teach on a computer science degree, and, you know, computer scientists are notorious for being really bad communicators, and we were aware of that. So what we used to do was get them in, we had a, a, a particular subject, which was about uh, producing a TV program, because that's something where you really have to work together, and some of the people we used to get to go in front of the camera, they completely freak out. But it was wonderful, because they'd end up, you know, effective uh, communicators at the, the end. And I've also noticed it in another context, where we're, we're teaching language learning online as well, because the students love to do the exercise, but they're not very keen on correcting each other's work. And you're saying, hey, but that's half the value of what you're actually doing. Okay, right. I'm aware that uh, time's um, coming out. I'm also like, my, how, how tired you are, so I'm not going to make you suffer too much more. I'd just like to have, if you will, please, one last wrap up, uh, take go home uh, comment from each of you. So Maha, if you'd like to go first, please. Oh, wow. Uh, last comment. Um, I'm, I've got a brain block. <laughs> you know what? You know what? This is my, this is what I'm going to say. Uh, pick the things that fulfill you for the next few months, because you've probably been working hard for the past six months or so. Uh, if you come to a professional, you know, come to a professional development event, if you find that it's not fulfilling, you just leave. It's not rude to leave things online. Nobody's going to see you walk out the door. <laughs> <laughs> just do the things that make you happy in these days because it's, it's a hard life. Indeed it is. That's a wonderful sentiment. Ma, thank you very much indeed. Martin, your last thought? It's a bit of a curveball you've thrown us at the end. <laughs> oh, absolutely. You should know me I'm by glad now. you went first with Maha. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think um, mine would be, yeah, t take care of yourselves. Don't, don't be too hard on yourself, I think. You know, and if you find your productivity isn't what it was in normal times, so don't worry about those things I think it's, uh, it's all good at the moment so just look after yourselves okay that's great and lastly Terry can we have your your gem of wisdom to leave us with please 
Well, I, I will do all the wonderful things we were saying about synchronous and here I'm struggling with trying to think of something uh, profound enough to end the session. <laughs> so, uh, but I'll pick up on Maha's comment about uh, hope at the University of Alberta, they have a hope institute and they sort of drive research in what hope does not medically in all sorts of ways. But if we're gonna be effective change agents, we can't be gloomy and talk about all of the challenges and all of the terrible things we have to, you know, keep keep hopeful. Wonderful sentiment. Thank you very much to uh, our three speakers. I'll give you a, a round of applause because I know that um, everybody else can't really do that. That's that's uh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on to our next uh, session, the Lisbon 2020 report, the research on ODL state of the art and uh, and the farewell. So I'm going to ask my colleagues, um, Alan Tate and Ines Hill Arena to. Uh, Turn on their uh, their cameras, please. And uh... team, I can't put the video. Oh, I'm sorry, Maria. Can you um, give Ines permission to uh, turn her camera on? I know so Alan as well, please. Yes, of course. Just a second, Ines. You'll be able to do that now. Or well, Maxim as well, of course. Sorry. Thank well, you. Okay. Thank you. Hello. Hi, Maxim. How are you? It's been a long time. <laughs> Lovely to see you. <laughs> okay, Ines, over to you. So should I start? Is Alan here? Uh, yes, he, he was. Um, Alan, let me just check. Yes, he was. Alan? Just checking the attendance. Yeah. At the oh. moment, I think Alan is not is not here. Let me check, please. But I think not. So oh, Alan is not here at the moment. So I guess you have to start in there. <laughs> okay, no problem. Um, well, just for introduction, uh, I was asked by Antonio Teixeira uh, to be the co-reporter of this research workshop with Alan Tate. And it has been two really intense days and very interesting. And I, I could draft my, my report that I will read now at the end of the morning. So I really enjoyed this last session more than the previous one because I, I was like free of uh, that role, but I would like to incorporate all some of the issues from this last session. Um, we have prepared uh, two independent reports and we will work together afterwards. So I think they are complementary. Um, well, Alan is here. I don't know if he wants to start or should I yeah, go I can, ahead? I've got no video at the moment. In the video. Hmm. Maria, can you uh, activate his video, please? Yes, we are trying to do it. <laughs> One moment. It's done. I have to do it myself. <laughs> you have, you can uh, connect the camera, Alan. It's still got, it's still got, uh, let's just see if that will work. Ah, oh, brilliant. Hello. There we go. Hi, hello. So I was just introducing what I what we were doing, and but I didn't start with the report. So, if you want to start as you wish. Okay. Shall I? Shall I go? So, um, thank you for inviting me back, and uh, great to see Maxime Jean Louis, an old colleague and friend. I think I dare say. Um, and thank you for the chance, Antonio, to work with Ines in in giving a, a sort of report. We decided to do this uh, independently, so to speak, to give two independent perspectives. We thought that would be more interesting in a coordinated report. So I'll, if I kick off, I, the first thing I want to say is what an extraordinary achievement this two and a half days has been in, in COVID times. It's provided such an enormously important element of continuity for Eden research and professional community. So um, Antonio Teixeira, I think you must take a, a bunch of flowers virtually, you and your team along with the Eden Secretariat for, for this extraordinary achievement. It must have been so much work. Um, I've never spent two and a half days online before, solidly, although we've all had eight months of Zooms and Teams. We haven't been in the office or on the campus since the end of March. It's not been a time of community, but this has felt like a time of community and it's been very, very welcome. But it's been hard work. My goodness, two and a half days online is hard work. But well, there's a genuine sense of the Eden community coming through to me during this meeting, and it's great, great to be back. 
And when I look at who has been here, there's very widespread participation across Europe, as well as further afield. And so it's great to see that Eden continues after 30 years to achieve its mission. I've been very struck by how many um, participants have been working, European participants are working in other European countries than their own as on an expatriate basis. And it's such an impressive vision of a multilingual, multicultural professional community, highly skilled in intercultural working, which is a 21st century skill, which is too often unremarked. And the conference has provided plenty of evidence that investigation and inquiry with a focus on practice continues in our field across a very wide field of research and scholarship. And I came across too many wonderful parallel sessions in particular, and I'm not going to have a chance to mention them all, so sorry about that. I've, I've tried to frame my thoughts um, following Boyer's understanding of research and scholarship, which you might remember, it was very, it must be 30 years old now, but I think it still remains contemporary. And he talked about four categories of research and scholarship, the scholarship of discovery, in your own discipline, the scholarship of integration that involves a synthesis of information across disciplines, the scholarship of application that goes beyond the duties of a faculty member to communities outside the university or college, and the scholarship of learning and teaching that involves a systematic study of teaching and learning processes. And I think we've had examples of all those kinds of scholarship during this meeting, but it's just a framework. See if you can place the examples that I select within that framework or use it to assess your own selection of what's been interesting uh, within those four categories. So let me first of all focus on the major themes that have struck me um, during this conference. And the first theme I pull out has been the obvious one, the COVID crisis and the move to online, the online pivot for campuses all around the world. And I think the president of Eden, Sandra Cucina, set the tone at the beginning of the conference when she reported that 60% of school and college students worldwide have undertaken online learning for the first time. I mean, that is an extraordinary phenomenon and an extraordinary number of people. And Tony Bates, who's um, from Contact North, Maxime Jean Lewis' own organization, it reported at the beginning of the meeting on a large survey of Canada and the USA of what had been happening during this COVID pandemic. And Tony forecasted a rise in Canada of something like 10% currently from learning online to 25 to 30% in the next five years. So that's a forecast which, which we will enjoy watching to see if it happens. He also said that he thought hybrid learning or blended learning will become the norm. And this throws up the need for systematic training for faculty, which may be a responsibility that falls in part to Eden, of course. And lastly, he made a very interesting remark, which I struck me as having a lot of truth in it, that how important it's going to be to reform the learning spaces on campus when campuses come to terms with the blended learning systems that they want to employ for the future. Um, and this COVID crisis has also thrown up a huge challenge for assessment, which has been talked about by a number of people. Um, for example, Ana Maria de Santis and colleagues from Modena and Emilio Romano universities reported on e-proctoring, um, a very challenging phenomenon. And Maria do Carmo Teixeira Pinto um, looked at the um, uh, potential for peer assessment to help us. And lastly, um, I hope I can be forgiven for mentioning the Oxford debate, where we discussed under the leadership of Christina Costa, Durham University in the UK, and Mar Perez Angustine of the Université Paul Sabatier in Toulouse, France, whether COVID forcing move to online for millions and millions of students around the world will in fact make a lasting impact on campus-based teaching or whether campuses will return to what they're familiar with with a sigh of relief when, when and if we eventually get COVID under control. The overall judgment was that um, COVID would make permanent change on, on campus-based teaching, but a significant minority did believe the campuses would go back to the familiar as soon as they can. And in a year's time, we'll hopefully be collecting the evidence across Europe uh, about what is happening and we'll see that reported at future even conferences. The second theme that I picked up on was artificial intelligence, AI. And I was struck in the session led by Cecilia Thomas from EOE Portugal on the ethical challenges of artificial intelligence in our field. She argued that commoditization was in tension with privacy with regard to data and proposed the need for active digital citizenship. And she 
worried that personalization in our field will actually become profiling, which is anti-open, and that the privacy essential to pedagogy will be lost. I also very much enjoyed the session by Patricia Bernodo and Ulf Daniel Ehlers from Baden-Württemberg's Duala Hochschule. And they reported on a grand challenge study of what AI might mean for the future uh, work they did with their students. Uh, it was a very interesting approach to learning through facilitation rather than through what somebody called bulimic teaching. I thought that was a great phrase, uh, <laughs> content heavy teaching. And this um, is so important for society, for work and for education. Uh, because do you remember all those promises 30 years ago made by some that the digital revolution would mean all unpleasant work would be done by computers. And we human beings would be having a three day working week at most and a life of leisure. Well, it didn't quite work out that way, did it? So how will the promises and potential of AI work out? And in particular for education, how will the conflict between people centered and commoditized big tech interests be resolved? This is surely going to be a major theme for future research, for critical research, which I hope we'll see reported on in future even conferences. And the third team, a uh, third theme I wanted to highlight, which, which I, was a big theme for me at least, was the question of openness and open scholarship, which is very important in our field of uh, activity. And uh, I really enjoyed the round table of senior scholars, which was facilitated by Ines. Uh, from Uled and my co-rapporteur, and she was working with Jose Duarte of Walk in Catalonia, Alison Littlejohn from UCL London, Rory McGrail from Athabasca, who had to stay up all night to do it, Paul Mann, and Eloy Rodriguez from Université Minho in Portugal. Um, and they discussed the issue of openness at a time of our societies being so shut down by COVID. And they, they argued that openness was more important than ever not only for the products which we're familiar with, but also for data. And they wondered whether this pivot to online is going to accelerate the pivot to open scholarship. But they also recognize the threats to openness from some who can increase the costs of open publishing. And they um, led me to look for the first time, first time I'd heard of it, for something called the uh, uh, Open Covid Pledge for Education, which you can find if you search for that. And the future, of the availability of research to all of us and its application is crucially connected to this issue of open scholarship. Let me just also um, reflect on some of the new voices, new voices to me at least, which I heard at this conference. And the first one was that of Ellen Helsper from London School of Economics. She's a very senior scholar, but I had never come across her before. And I think this is an example of, of one of Boyer's uh, uh, categories of scholarship because it shows how expertise in one discipline can come across and be influential in another. I think Ellen helps our field adopt new perspectives on digital inclusion and exclusion, which is her field of, of particular competence, and gain a deeper understanding of what digital skills can mean. She debunked further this myth of the digital native and pointed out that people who thought they had the most confidence in their digital skills didn't actually have them in reality. She also identified the fact that lower digital skills were very often related to poverty. Some inequalities have been amplified, but not all. Gender, for example, has had more negative outcomes. She argued that support must be more than skills training and include quality content and services for all. And so I think this Ellen Halsper's work will be very helpful for us in our field in um, further essential monitoring and exclusion and inclusion and developing nuanced understanding. The second new voice that I heard is indeed um, a newcomer, and that was the person, Irene Charbonneau, who won the Best Research Paper Award. Um, and she, her work was on social constructivism as a lens of managing online engagement. So Irene is a French researcher based in Sweden, and her work is on an online course in Finland. What a set of impressive intercultural skills to have. And she insisted on the creating space for students online to make sense of learning through their mutual recognition of each other as learners and individuals, and that this would reinforce their engagement. So Irene, if I'm allowed to say this, is a young scholar with her career ahead of her. And it's worth remembering that you heard her 
a voice for the first time at the Eden Research Workshop 2020. I think you're going to hear it again. I also thought to myself how I would enjoy a conversation between Irene and Terry Anderson. And Terry's version of connectivist pedagogy was one that I think would connect well with Irene's uh, discussion of constructivism. Uh, and connectivist pedagogy is surely going to be a significant theme for the future. So when we um, remember that Irene won the best research paper, I think it's also worth remembering the great support that the Ulrich Bernard Foundation has given to Eaton over, I think, as long as 20 years in supporting research and scholarship with the, with the best research paper award. So well worth remembering that. So just in conclusion, before I hand over to Ines and for her thoughts, I think this Eden Research Workshop has seemed to me to be a triumph of resilience for the Eden professional community. And if COVID is some sort of plague year, a year of the pest in Europe, I'm sure this event is going to uh, uh, make us feel confident that a renaissance is going to follow. So thanks again to Antonio Teixeira, to his team at Open U Portugal, and to Eden for all their work in putting this conference on. So let me now hand straight over to Ines for her thoughts, which I'm looking forward to. Thank you, Alan. Um, I will I will first show us this um, cloud. Do you see it? The cloud where word clouds. It's made from the titles of the all the contributions, and I think it's well. It's it's a, a summary of what was talked about during this this event, um, and I will read my. My impressions is it's something I, I never do, so I don't know if I will be able to get stick to the to the <laughs> report, but I will try. Um, um, this in this uh, conference in this event, it was uh, with no doubt that the pandemic was uh, the situation was very present all, all the time, and the, the pandemic has led to the widening of the online provision in education. Um, this rapid change has been addressed in presentations, in plenaries, parallel sessions at the Oxford debate, and there were specific sessions de dedicated to the analysis of the impact of the COVID-19 in education. And overall, a, an overall reflection about all that was the, the question about what will remain in the long term, what, what will be the impact of these changes, and what will remain in the long term. And two out of three people at the Oxford debate from the Oxford debate participants said that they thought that the changes will remain. I, I was among them. And to me, this is in, uh, in accordance or aligned with one of the words in the cloud, which is the transformation or change. And a, a positive on our optimistic horizon and keep good expectations about transformative potential of a current crisis or situation, even such a difficult one as this one, and um, opt being optimistic about the potential development that education can generate, to me, is consubstantial to education. It, it, it goes with being an educator, and I, I think many people at this conference are educators. And this was also raised in the previous conference about the hope and about uh, resilience, and I think it was present. And the transformation processes starts from ourselves. And I have seen many presentations reporting about different studies undertook at the micro level. So there were researchers that have shared their analysis about the courses they teach or their teaching practices before or during the pandemic. And many of these contributions try, were trying to understand the learner's experience and how they were living and performing in during the pandemic and, and different the comparing between the on-site and online settings. And this student's perception and satisfaction service and interviews have provided very valuable feedback that can help to make decisions for improving the quality of these courses. And one of the topics that had deserved a, quite a lot of attention in some researcher, researches and studies is the social di dimension in the teaching and learning process. And the analysis and promotion of the students' interaction for learning purposes, which is underpinned by social constructivist theoretical perspective, has been the topic in some of the contributions. 
and remark the role of learners as agents in their learning processes and remarks also the human side of the digital environment. And in this sense, the community of inquiry framework has been present in, in a specific workshop yesterday and also in different studies, particularly dealing with the social dimension. This is the case for the best paper award that also Alan mentioned uh, right, right now. But uh, regarding transformation and beyond our respective spaces for control, power, or change that we have each, of us have, have, each of us have as practitioners, this is a limited space and there are other transformations needed. And structural inequalities were raised during the event. The, the pandemic has shown that the digital divide is still not solved, it's not, so, it's not a solved problem. And there are difficult, difficulties and inequalities both in the access to the digital devices and to proper internet in many population sectors in different countries. But also there is the digital divide with regards to digital literacy, even in the more digitalized countries such as the European countries. Um, this was also raised by the scholar who Alan mentioned before, a specialist in inequalities. So the use of the digital tools for educational learning purposes needs a specific training, both for the teachers and for the learners. And this teacher training was exploring many contributions in the conference as well. Um, moving from the micro level, there were also some contributions at the meso level, reporting about institutional change experiences. And there were some managers, so also researchers sharing their description and analysis of the digital transformation of their institutions which went through converting the paper-based exams into online exams, for instance, or using mostly synchronous tools. This was also raised in the previous session. The use of artificial intelligence and data analytics, training of teachers and tutors. So this move to digital assessment specifically has been very relevant in the conference and during the pandemic for all the institutions, including open universities. And there were concerns about proctoring academic integrity, but also about the need to rethink in the long, in the medium term, the way uh, we are doing the assessment. So words like authentic assessment, formative assessment were also on the debate. And also coming back to this institutional perspective, and there was a general claim at the event from the open universities, open and distance education universities, about their historical contribution and accumulated expertise that has not been much considered in this move towards remote teaching in recently. So the emergency remote teaching has resembled the face-to-face -face mode just with sometimes just synchronous lectures in different platforms. Um, the move towards online education is not considered in all the existing research and practice background that communities such as Eden uh, provide. But um, nevertheless, despite this, that uh, open universities have a tradition in e-learning, these open universities have also considered that they have not gone too far in their own digital transformation yet. So th there were some voices from people from open universities saying this. So this is also an opportunity for open and distance university. Um, just as a sum up of this uh, section is that the, the rapid reaction to the lockdown is not in question and the problems were safe and they were very creative and quick mitigation solutions for the students so they could complete their courses. But there is uncertainty about the maintenance and so sustainability of these emergency solutions, or if we are going back to the, to the normal situation. And with regards to open research that also Alan mentioned, the round panel session this morning provided some insight about a similar situation we are like halfway in the process. So the pandemic is an opportunity to promote open access to research results. And for instance, in the health area, this has been a must. Research about the COVID-19 had to be public and rapidly available for all the researchers. But there are remaining cultural practices, like the way that research and uh, researchers are assessed, are evaluated for promotion, 
and there are commercial interests that uh, profit for commercial publicists who have a big interest in pub in publication and who have joined the open to take advantage of charging with article processing charges to authors and institutions. So there are this type of barriers that difficult the expansion of open scholarship. And also other, other challenges were raised beyond open access to publications, but covering other parts of the process like open data, open peer review, sustainability and innovation in all the digital publication process. And as a final remark, I wanted to say that uh, similar to what's happened in, in research publication where corporate private interests have a very relevant role in setting the agenda, we should not forget the question who is setting the agenda in education. And there was a lot of discussion in this conference about the students, teachers and researchers and also managers and institutions as agents for consolidating the good practices in e-learning. But there are other agents at the ma macro level as well, such as policies and regulations in our respective countries and regions, and also corporations that provide technological tools and also educational content who set the basis of what we can do when going online. And I think this is an issue that was not dealt so, so deeply at the conference, or at least it, it, maybe I missed those sessions. But still the conference, the, to me, and despite these difficult circumstances, we are still living, we are still inside this, the, the storm, inside the pandemic. But the conference has been, once again, a community for sharing, learning, and networking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alan Ines. Can I hand over to Maxim now, please? Thank you very much. And uh, I'm coming at it from Canada's perspective. And one of the things I'd like to highlight is from having listened to the summary from Alan, as well as from Ines, which are very, very uh, insightful in some ways, Eden, in doing this work over the last couple of days, you've put together the building blocks for what we in Canada are working on, what I call virtual learning strategies. I want you to picture that in Ontario, we have 24 colleges, 22 universities, and the government is about to announce in about three or four weeks, a virtual learning strategy. And when I, when I hear Alan, when I hear Ines, there are at least four or five areas where what you have come up with in terms of insights are precisely the building blocks for a strategy moving forward. And I'd like you to understand that it's not only research that you are doing or insights or analysis, but you are really contributing to major decisions by government that have a huge impact on populations in other countries as well. Example, in the area of content, I've heard Alan and I've heard Ines talk about that is how we need to also be a catalyst for development of content in a way that is ensuring high quality, in a way that is ensuring open access. And that is a very big preoccupation here as we in this sector trying to pull together a strategy moving forward. I've also heard the point about capacity building in terms of instructional development, as well as training of instructors. And again, here, as we are putting together a virtual learning policy and strategy, this is an incredibly important part of that strategy. A third one as well that I've heard Ines mentioned the word digital divide. So infrastructure for us in terms of uh, in an area which is the size of Germany and France put together to give you a sense of the scale, that is access to, it, to broadband and digital divide become a very important issue. And again, your deliberations, your insights, your thoughts are contributing to that thinking here across in North America. There is also the question of, uh, I think it was Alan who mentioned about the myth of the digital native. 
And again, here we are very much looking at digital fluency as an area that we really need to focus on because we should not assume that students necessarily have that capacity. And lastly, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the whole aspect of sharing internationally, which Eden does so well, which both Alan and Ines in their summary show that the range of presenters, the issues being discussed, I think bring that community, not just in Europe, but also in North America together. So let, let, me, we, let me recap by saying in the area of content, in the area of capacity building, in the area of digital fluency, in the area of infrastructure and international cooperation, what Ines and Alan have summed up are good building blocks. And as an opportunistic participant, I'm learning a lot from that. And I'll be sharing that with our governments, our universities and our colleges here in Canada. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maxim. That's very, your very encouraging words. It's nice to, uh, to see that the, uh, the output of the conference goes beyond mere academic um, uh, areas of, of influence. That was very good indeed. So finally, I'd like to uh, hand over to Sandra Kutina, the president of Eden now to, uh, to finalize the, uh, the research workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you, team. And thank you to all rapporteurs. Uh, excellent, excellent remarks. Uh, now I would like to share my presentation. Um, I'm not sure I can do that. Just give me a second so that I, I have a presentations which I want to share. So, okay, yeah, I just found it. Yes, share. Okay, um, do you see it? Perfectly, perfectly, go ahead. Okay, great. So we have come to the end of one really terrific event. This is Eden uh, Research Workshop online for the first time. And let me conclude uh, with some uh, information. So if we look uh, at the numbers, we had more than 200 delegates from 43 countries, really impressive numbers. I'm certain that we can be very proud of them. The next one is that we had 48 full papers, seven workshops, 16 posters, and 14 PhD symposium presentation, Oxford style debate, excellent one, and round table discussion today with really, really good remarks on open, uh, openness uh, and open scholarship. Excellent keynote speakers uh, and the rapporteurs, uh, moderators. Uh, also, we uh, awarded our colleagues with Eden Senior Fellow Award to Irina Antonella and Joseph, and also with Fellow Award to Maria Rosaria, Ulf Kovadonga, James and Radu, who we already awarded uh, in June uh, in Team Shwara at the online uh, annual conference. And we uh, had the winner of Best Research Paper Award to uh, Irene Charbonneau from Stockholm University in Sweden. Um, and also the new, uh, the new award, uh, the Best Research in Progress Award uh, which went to the Universidade Aberta in Portugal. So um, very nice uh, indeed. I already also uh, voted uh, between uh, three proposed uh, posters. Um, we are coming to the end uh, to the three wonderful days we had. Although online, I think they managed to show that we can be community, that we can over uh, past the issue of not being able to be present. I am also missing the chance to have lousy coffee and uh, maybe not so good uh, branches, but to be able to be physically uh, with uh, other colleagues and chat and um, share experience. Uh, and of course, have a good uh, glass of wine after all the events. But I hope we will manage 
in few uh, in future to uh, come to this uh, way situation that COVID will, will not be an uh, issue anymore. I wish to thank, first of all, to my dear colleague Antonio Teixeira from Universidad de Aberta, who hosted with the uh, dist edu uh, education and distance learning center of uh, Universidad de Aberta, this 11th Eden research workshop. I wish to thank conference program committee, uh, best research paper, what jury, keynotes, Eden and UP members and fellows. I wish to thank to the authors, to session moderators, rapporteurs, and technical chairs, and first of, and above all, to all participants who contributed that this research workshop has been the highlight of the Eden events. Also, in the end, I need to mention that we had the uh, Portuguese, Portugal Foundation for Science and Technology who, provi uh, uh, who provided us with Zoom environment. We had international pan partner Contact North and conference uh, sponsor Clothes. And let me in the end announce some further Eden and uh, events. This is open classroom conference started uh, starting uh, in November now, uh, which is all co-organized by uh, Elino Germanici Agogi um, and uh, the Eden. And also before that, we have just one week uh, of the rest. Uh, on November 2 to 6th, we have Eden Online and Distance Learning Week. Uh, plus one, because we will join the European Vocational Training Week on the 9th uh, uh, of November. So uh, be, stay with us. Uh, we are continue with our activities uh, very soon. And at the end, I would like to announce that Eden 30th Annual Conference will be next year in Madrid, in UNED. And I'm hoping that Tim will wait there with us for us with a good glass of wine to uh, be able to drink it jointly in physical <laughs> presence. So once, of, once again, thank you all for being with us for this is really great Eden Research Workshop. Thank you. And we wish you the best from North America. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Maxim. Thank you, Antonio. Pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Bye all. Uh, Bye -bye. Sandra. Sandra, yes. it seems that the uh, secretary would like to have a photo. So uh, can we ask everyone in the in the, the room to connect their cameras? So yes. for the final sure. I'll stop sharing. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. And in the end, I, I almost forgot to, <laughs> to say a big thank to Eden Secretariat for providing really good support in enabling that this conference uh, happens. Uh, so thank all of uh, colleagues from Secretariat with uh, leadership of Andre Shizuch. Okay, so we are doing the photo. We have to smile. <laughs> I don't even need to tuck my tummy in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I missed the opportunity to show the, my gowns and everything, but uh, well, they will have to wait for the next year. Well, may maybe you can say goodbye at the same time, okay? Yes. <laughs> so, bye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I got the photo. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. right. Thank you as well, Judith. See you next time in Madrid, at least. <laughs> yeah.